My name is Larry Bloom. I teach economic theory, game theory, general equilibrium theory, decision theory at uh, Cornell University and also at uh, EHS in Vienna. And uh, I am um, going to talk to you today um, about uh, the economic theory surrounding uh, social interaction models. Uh, you've already heard a lot, I think, about social interaction models. And um, uh, so just to refresh your memory, um, social interaction models, these are things that, uh, 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 you know, we, we, we think of, of, of people engaged, it's hard for us to believe, but people are actually engaged in social activities beyond markets, right? People do other things, you know, they, they, they uh, have parties and they get married and do all kinds of other things. And, you know, economic life sits in this larger matrix of, of, of social, um, of our even larger social life. And um, that larger social life actually has an effect on the economic decisions that we make and therefore on the economic outcomes that economic systems present. And uh, so, um, people who are interested in social interaction models are interested in both of these things. And, um, uh, and uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about, um, uh, about what these models are and what we can do with them and uh, so on and so forth. But I'm largely going to be talking about this stuff from a theoretical perspective. Um, and the reason for that is that everything begins with theory. Okay, now most of you probably uh, are really pleased to be done with theory, right? You're, I, I tell you, everybody here is uh, more or less a graduate student in some program, is that correct? Yes, no? You can nod your heads or like raise your thumb if that's true. Okay, all right, good, it is true. That's what I thought. And so you did theory in your first year, right? And then you said, okay, I never have to take another theory course. Andreu Moscolo was very nice. Goodbye, Andreu, right? And that was the end of that book, end of that class, okay. But you will never escape theory. If you become an empirical economist, you will become a theorist without really recognizing it. So I want to actually make this, um, uh, this idea um, uh, stick in your heads a little bit. I want, I, want, I want to make this idea salient to you. I want you to really understand um, that, you, um, uh, that, that theory is, 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 is really important. Um, and not because we build theoretical models all the time. Uh, you know, the, the, the ability to manipulate game theory models and general equilibrium models and things like that is perhaps not so important um, if you're going to be an empirical economist. But why is theory important? The reason is, is, that, is that when we talk about economic phenomena, when we talk about treatment effects, right? When we talk about things like, uh, um, uh, like uh, what would be a good example, like, like pouring more money into a particular kind of classroom innovation or something like that, or passing, I'm actually writing on this now, so I've been thinking about this, um, passing regulations to um, um, safety regulations for automobiles, okay? Uh, there's a wonderful paper on this by Sam Peltzman in the JPE back in 1975, where he showed that, um, uh, that the introduction in the United States of all these safety requirements, which went into effect in 1968, like putting seatbelts in cars, collapsible steering wheels, um, uh, non-locking brakes, things like this, um, that they actually had no effect on, 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 on saving lives, okay? Zero effect on saving lives. Um, uh, and, 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 and the reason, and, and so we want to talk about how you might reach conclusions like that, right? How do we make uh, that was a causal claim that I just made. I said that safety regulations cause no change, right, in, in, in the uh, uh, rate of highway fatalities in the United States after these innovations, right? So that's a causal claim. Um, if I introduce um, some new um, uh, arrangement in a classroom, um, if we restructure classrooms in particular ways, like uh, uh, maybe grouping students by ability or something like that. And then we want to ask, what kind of educational outcomes does that cause, right? Does that cause some students to do better? Does it cause some students to do worse? So on and so forth. So we use the word cause a lot, right? Another thing we use a lot is the word explain, right? We always say, uh, how many of you have ever attended job talks? 
right? When at your universities, when candidates come in to give uh, presentations for jobs. So here's a little hint for you. The last thing you, you do not want to say in your job talk, this is the big, the terrible moment in a job talk. Someone says at the end of their talk, okay, and to conclude, I have explained. And then they go on to talk about what it is that they think that they have explained. And I always want to jump out of my seat and say, what do you mean by the word explain? In what sense has um, some numbers in a table that you, you know, put up uh, on a slide in your talk explained anything at all? Okay, so where does explanation come from? Most explanations in the social sciences are in fact causal explanations. There are a lot of other kinds of explanations out there. There are, for example, things called teleological explanations or functional explanations. Um, you know, when we say, for example, the, the, um, uh, um, uh, the per, you know, that, 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 uh, um, I'm trying to think of a good example off the top of my head, and I can't think of a good example off the top of my head, precisely because I thought of one 10 minutes ago, but now that I'm actually talking, um, it slipped my mind. All right, but we have a lot of these things. Like, oh, you know, actually, a, a, a lot of biology, um, uh, evolutionary biology, I actually think it was being kind of functional because it's, so why do we have, why are humans primarily, um, you know, um, you know, why do they, you know, largely kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, monogamous, right? And 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 the answer is because it's fitness maximizing, right? Well, that's that's something. You know, the, the purpose of this is to maximize fitness. Okay, that's a that's not a causal explanation, right? That is a uh, um, is a functional explanation. Um, uh, you know that the the. Uh, um, uh, the, the purpose of this table is to um, uh, is to hold up the things on it. That's kind of a functional explanation of a table. Okay, um, the table has a purpose. The purpose is to do X. Okay, um, uh, uh, but our our explanations are not are not are, as I say are not teleological explanations. Um, uh, actually, they're 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 causal explanations. And what do we mean by a causal explanation? We say that something came about because something happened, right? Um, uh, 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 that uh, the prices went up because of a change in monetary policy or something like that, right? Um, and uh, uh, so we're, how, do we, how is it that we get to make causal statements? Where do, where, where do causal statements come from? And this is the big surprise, okay? Causal statements, when we say that A causes B, that's actually, you know, philosophers debate whether there's such a thing as cause in the real world, okay? They ask whether there is this general thing called cause, they ask whether there is something when we say that A causes B, we ask whether, you know, is there something, something really special about the relationship between A and B? Um, the word they use is supervene, is cause something that supervenes upon the relationship between A and B, okay? But what we do is where do we get our causal ideas from, okay? Um, uh, cause may or may not exist in the world. It may or may not exist in the specific instances, so on and so forth. But where cause does exist for sure is in our heads. Cause is the way that we structure the world, okay? So cause in the world, in the words of Jim Heckman, I suppose that most of you know who Jim Heckman is because among other, um, a uh, very well-known econometrician from the University of Chicago who won a Nobel Prize, um, and um, a colleague of Stephen Durloff's who you spoke with uh, uh, earlier this week. Um, and Jim Heckman wrote a paper which contains this most beautiful sentence, cause is a property of a model, okay? Causes come from models. Causes come from our way of structuring the world. So when we, when we, engage in an empirical exercise and we come up with a bunch of numbers at the end, a bunch of, a bunch of coefficients, essentially you come up with a bunch of correlations, okay? How do we decide which of those correlations are important and which of those correlations are not, right? How do we decide which um, uh, are significant for us, for our understanding of the phenomena and which are, are just, you know, coincidental or, or accidental um, or, you know, um, uh, that kind of thing. And, and the answer is that our model tells us this. Our model delineates at the, out, at the outset um, the possibilities for causal relationships, okay? Um, when we write down a bunch of functions, when we say that, 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 X, that Y is a function of X, but not a function of Z, 
Okay, and then we happen to observe a correlation between you know y and z. We say, well, that's not causal because it wasn't in our model. Okay, now maybe of course our model is wrong. Maybe there's another model um, that might actually explain why why z might be a cause of 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 um, of y. But when we but when we interpret data, we are interpreting data in light of a model. Now that model might be a formal written out model. It might be some kind of nice piece of game theory or something like that. Um, or, you know, it might be a, you know, you, you always estimate a statistical model. The theoretical model behind that is something that might only be in your head that you might never have written it down. Okay. But um, nonetheless, when you say this is important, this isn't, okay, you're making a causal claim and you're making a claim that comes from the model um, that sits in your head, okay? And you've heard people do this in talks all the time, all right? So you're always using theory whether or not um, you know it. And now the, 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 you know, the, the uh, thing I guess I want to impress upon you is that sometimes it's a really good idea to make explicit um, uh, the, uh, uh, the theory that you're using. Um, why might this be so? Uh, um, uh, so, for example, think about, about empirical talks when you, that you've sat in where people have been arguing over omitted variable bias, okay? Very often, the question is whether or not the variable that is omitted really should be omitted or not. This is really a theoretical question. This is not a statistical question. Um, another bias that we talk about all the time, right, is um, uh, omitted equation bias, Okay, there is a, um, a relationship between some variables that is not part of the statistical model that you estimate. Okay, now, you know, very often, you know, we're aware of this. Okay, but again, um, uh, you know, an admitted relationship, it might be admitted on purpose because you don't think it's really there. Okay, or it might be admitted for other reasons. But when it is emitted for other reasons, we're aware that it's emitted. We use things like, like instrumental variable estimation techniques, right? In order to solve the endogeneity problem that we're going to have because of the emitted, the emitted equation. Okay. Whether or not the equation belongs in the model, that's a theoretical question. That's not an empirical question. Okay. Um, uh, so now let's think about instrumental variables. We're going to use instrumental variables because we have um, an emitted equation. We have some endogeneity. Uh, that comes about because of admitted equation bias. What are we going to do about that? So let's think about, about what are the requirements for a good instrument in a, in a linear model. And I, by the way, am the last person who should be um, talking to you about econometrics, okay? I've actually never really run a regression, okay? Um, uh, but uh, I never even turned in the econometrics paper that I was supposed to do in graduate school. Um, so... Um, uh, later on, I wrote a theoretical econometrics piece um, uh, that was published in the JPE, and I sent it to my by now retired professor of econometrics, who said, "I'll give you a B minus." Um, and uh, uh, so uh, that's as close as I've come to actually running stuff. But I have looked over the shoulders of people who have. And let's think for a moment about about what makes a good instrument in an, in a, in a, uh, a a linear model. Well, there are you know basically two requirements. One requirement is the instrument needs to be uh, correlated with the variable that we are instrumenting for. This is obvious. Okay. Another requirement is that the instrument needs to be uncorrelated with the errors. Okay. So let's think about what goes on in the errors. Right. Most of the time, the phenomena that we're looking at are sufficiently complex that we cannot say that they're monocausal. We might be looking at one aspect of a phenomena, but there's a lot of other stuff that's going on as well. There might be other things, other kinds of causal features that we think of as being orthogonal to the features that we're interested in, okay? So they don't really affect our estimates in some way, um, but... Um, uh, but they are there, we recognize that they're there, okay? And so we just go and we do what they do. Now, where do all of these other causal factors that we haven't modeled explicitly, where are they? Where are all of these other causal, causal models themselves? They're embedded in the error terms, okay? So, um, uh, so what we are claiming when we say that the instrument is uncorrelated with the error terms is that we're saying that the instrument, one of the things, we're saying a number of things. One of those things is that the instrument is not part of another causal explanation for the same phenomena. 
right? There might be two or three or four different causal pathways. We're investigating just one of them, right? But we need to make sure that our instrument is not right part of, of numbers two, three, or four, because if it is, then it's gonna be correlated with the error term in, in our model one, and therefore um, we're not gonna have a good instrument. So these are theoretical issues. Right? Can this can this instrument can this particular variable be part of another causal explanation? That's a theoretical question. Okay. Um, uh, all right. So I think I've convinced you. I hope I've convinced you that that oftentimes when you are making statistical arguments, you're actually making arguments about causal models. Okay. And uh, I think I think uh, uh, um, it's often very helpful to know what that causal model is so that you can answer these criticisms more precisely. So by being aware of your causal models. Now, how actually do we establish causation? There are lots of theories of causation out there. There are kind of two that are really important, I think, I think for us um, and, and, and for most sciences. Um, and both of them come from David Hume. Um, and um, uh, uh, one of them uh, is, what is a, leads to a class of theories of causation that are called, called regularity theories. Um, so uh, Hume says that uh, um, uh, when A follow when B follows A regularly, when 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 we see many many instances of B um, of of A that then are followed by B, and A and B are contiguous in time and space. And first A, then B then another instance, first A, then B. If this kind of happens regularly, then we can say that there is a causal relationship that A causes B. Now, you have, to, you have to think about what it means to be contiguous in time and space, because quantum mechanics has something to say about that these days. But, um, uh, but nonetheless, you know, we, 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 at least for social phenomena, we kind of know what that means. Um, and the relevant scales are obvious from the applications. This idea of causation is what drives, I think, a lot of time series analysis. Because what is time series analysis, essentially, by looking at one very long data stream, Right, and saying in this data stream, we see regularly that A follows or that B follows A. Okay, that's essentially what time series does, right? And that gives you an autocorrelation coefficient or a cross correlation, autocorrelation coefficient, or is it an auto cross correlation efficient? I don't remember which coefficient, I don't remember which. Um, and, that, and then you make causal claims from that, right? So this is what you do with VARs and stuff like that. Um, the other kind, though, is what, what microeconomists do. Um, and I'm guessing that most of you are microeconomists, um, is, is different, right? And we're interested in, in what's known as um, perturbation theories, or perturb, you know, the perturbation theories of causation. The idea of a perturbation uh, theory of causation is simply that we will say that A causes B if a change in A results in a change in B holding everything else equal, okay? So uh, you know, a lot of people write on this today. This is this is you know this is a big thing among philosophers. They talk about 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 counterfactual theories of causation. The first person actually to really work out what that might mean for an analysis of some kind, surprisingly enough, and he does get the credit for it, is Alfred Marshall in his Principles of Economics, because this idea of holding everything equal and jiggling only one variable. Okay, um, this is what he refers to. Well, he referred to it in, in Latin, and, Latin uh, and we've actually shortened the Latin quite a bit today. And we refer to this today as ceteris paribus, right? Which sounds nothing like the way the Latin should actually be pronounced, by the way. So this idea of using comparative statics as a way of identifying cause, seeing a change in some exogenous variable or some endogenous variable, holding everything else constant and looking for a shift, right? That is, um, a, that's our counterfactual theory of causation. Um, and if any of you would like to read something on this, I have a long paper um, on, 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 on what causal modeling is about that um, uh, we could spend time talking about, but I don't wanna spend more time on it here, but I wanna point out to you that, that, that um, without models, you can't talk about cause, okay? Um, and if you can't talk about cause, then why are you wasting our time in a seminar, okay? At the end of the day, we care about causal claims. Descriptive, that's not to say that descriptive some uh, papers and descriptive research is useless. It's not, because when we look at descriptive studies, um, it points the way to important things, okay? Uh, but uh, things that we should look into. So I think of descriptive analysis is really exploratory analysis um, that we then need to come back at with, uh, with well-formed structural models. 
but um, uh, you know, to the extent that we can. But um, uh, but uh, in order to do that, you can't escape theorists. So my claim is that all of you are theorists. So um, let me now talk about uh, uh, put down the philosophy and actually get to the subject matter. What are social interactions? Okay, um, there's a lot of different kinds of social interactions out there. There's social learning, right? So all of us, all of us learn from you know our friends about what are good restaurants to go to, you know what are good books to read, so on and so forth, right? Um, uh, and we pass that information on to others, right? This is social learning. Um, Social norms, I think you all know what social norms are. All of our, you know, we dress in certain ways, we behave in classrooms in certain ways. Um, you know, one thing that I can tell you having, having, having uh, lectured in classrooms live, not by Zoom, but live in both um, China, in, in all of China, Europe, and the United States, um, is that the norms around how students uh, that students hold about how to behave in classrooms is very different in the three, in the three places. Okay, I think that's really fascinating. Um, so, um, uh, so social norms are a kind of social interaction. We're not going to talk about them much today, I think. Peer effects. Okay, how many of you are interested in the economics of education? Any of you? One hand, only one hand. And then there's all those people who are two hands. Thank you, Maria. Uh, three hands, Lee, thank you. Right, okay. So some of you are, and there's probably more of you there. Um, Thank you, Nobuyuki. There are more of you there. Yeah, and I would really, again, let me ask if I can see everybody's face. I know that some of you might have low bandwidth collection, connections and you really can't do that. But if you can, it would be good. And that's a really cool background, by the way. I like all those books. Um, so um, in any event, uh, uh, peer effects, right, for the economics of education. Is there a, there is a hand up. So is there a question? Do you have a question, Haijing? Uh, no, no, no. I, I just want to say I'm also interested in education. Ah, okay, good. Okay. Uh, uh, so it's not foolish for me. I'm going to talk a lot, actually. Where, uh, not a lot, but I'm going to talk about a bit about pure effects in classrooms. Okay. So, you know, we all have this idea that, 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 um, uh, uh, that if uh, uh, children are in classrooms with high performing peers, this will lift their performance as well. Okay, and uh, um, uh, so, um, you know, they're, they're, it, these things are, by the way, devilishly hard to actually find in the data, but I don't know anybody who doesn't believe in them, right? I don't know anybody who says, you can, you know, I've got a, a kid who I want to go somewhere. You can put him in a classroom with a really dumb bunch of students because no economist has yet actually found a convincing peer effect on educational outcomes. OK, um, so um, uh, I think the problem, you know, the problem is with our data and the way that we measure things. And and and, you know, there is evidence in favor of pure effects, by the way, but it's just not enormously convincing. Um, there are all kinds of different pure effect or um, social interaction effects out here um, that come under the rubric of strategic complementarities. Um, uh, and and we'll maybe talk about some examples of those. What kind of, of, of phenomena uh, uh, have been in what, for what kind of phenomena have peer effect models proven useful? Um, here's a list on the left, um, both for career choices and retirement and labor markets. And we are gonna talk about those today. Um, fertility in, in decisions about whether or not to get pregnant. People tend to get pregnant when their friends are getting pregnant, if they're female. Um, and um, uh, health. Uh, a lot of peer effects around usage of health, okay, of, 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 of well, first off, um, you know, how healthy are you? Um, uh, because disease and stuff is contagious, as we know, but beyond that, right, what do you know about health? How do you think about health? When do you go to a doctor and when do you not, right? Or when do you go to, you know, other kinds of medical or non-medical practitioners? Um, these are, these are, are, are heavily influenced by peer effects. Educational outcomes I've just mentioned. Violence, right? Mobs, um, terrorism, things like this. This um, uh, uh, people have brought peer effect models to the study of these things. Juvenile violence in particular. It has been said that criminal violence, I'm sorry, that adult criminality is a single person activity, but juvenile criminality is a group activity. Okay, that 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 young people who engage in crime are are, are doing this because they're influenced by their peers. Uh, and I've mentioned um, 
uh, on the left, this slide is a bit redundant, uh, a bunch of mechanisms uh, that, that, um, uh, that, that, you know, which I actually already have mentioned, so I won't, I won't go into them anymore. They've been brought to bear in all of these cases. Um, so let me jump to um, um, an application of thinking about pure effects and crime in order to um, kind of motivate why pure effects are an interesting thing to look at, okay? Um, so there is a, a, a paper, I think actually, that had a lot to do with kicking off the contemporary, contemporary uh, uh, um, or the current interest in social interaction models. Um, uh, this paper by Ed Glazer, Bruce Sasserdote, and Jose Schechtman appeared in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 1996. Okay, and at the end, of, I think you have access to my slides. Um, uh, if not, you will get access to my slides. And the last several pages of my slides are references, so you can um, uh, uh, um, you can um, track some of these things down. So this is a paper um, that appeared in the in the in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 1996. As I said, it kind of really kicked off interest in social interaction models. So here is the puzzle. I think you've had the chance, as I've been blabbing on here, you've had the chance to read what the slide says. This is a quotation, a long quotation from one of the, um, from a couple of pages of the paper. Um, uh, and the puzzle is the following, that if you look at criminality, um, incidents of criminality um, across uh, cities, um, you know, in the uh, um, in the United States, it's also been shown to be true for European cities. I don't know where else. Um, you see that there is a huge variation in crime rates. Okay, so you know, New York might have a very low crime rate. San Francisco might have a very high crime rate. What they didn't point out, but what's also true, is that there's a great deal of variation, a large variance in crime rates over time. Okay, and uh, so. Um, uh, so how should, you know, and, and, and so what does it mean to have to say that there is, um, uh, that the variance, the large variance is in, in crime rates across space and time is inexplicable, okay? Well, you know, we might look at cities' characteristics and we might um, essentially estimate the criminality, the probability of an individual, any in, given individual in the city committing a crime, okay, based on their characteristics, so on and so forth. Then we might kind of, um, uh, integrate that out over all the, you know, the different distribution of characteristics in the city um, on the assumption that all of these people are kind of independent decision makers. And out of that, we could construct, um, uh, you know, what would be, uh, you know, variance in crime rates over cities, okay? Um, and if we were to perform that exercise, look at the variance in crime rates over cities on the assumption that all criminals are basically independent decision makers, we would come up with a range of, of variances that we would expect to see. The range of variances that we do see is much larger than that. So how do we explain that, okay? And that's what, what uh, uh, Glazer, Sacerdote, and Checkman set out to do. Uh, and I didn't manage to, okay. So what they did, they used theory in a very interesting way. They did not develop a model that they were going to estimate it. This paper contains estimates. Um, but the estimates that it contains um, uh, are, while motivated by a theoretical model, don't come directly from um, a theoretical model. Um, they develop a theoretical model to talk about how pure effects um, might be important, okay, um, and uh, for determining crime. And what they, they did was they wrote down the simplest possible model that you could imagine the stupidest possible model you could imagine. One so simple that every reader of the QJE could actually follow it, okay? Uh, they did this in order to make a point to show how social influence, okay, can, uh, um, uh, can uh, be a source of, of this excess variance. So here is their model. We're gonna imagine that there are two N plus one people that live on an integer lattice, that live on a line. Okay, so already we're pretty far away from reality, but remember what they're trying to do here is just make a point, okay? And there are three kinds of people in the world. There are saints. Saints uh, are type zeros for us, by the way. Uh, the zero is a halo, 
up here, okay? Saints are really good people. They never commit crimes, okay? They're just good through and through, okay? Some of you no doubt are saints, okay? Then there's type ones. Type ones are sinners. These are people who are just innately criminals who will take advantage of any opportunity to commit a crime. Um, would anybody like to volunteer for this role? Who, who in the class is a sinner? Okay, any of you? Okay, no one's willing to admit it. Okay, typical, typical sinner behavior, I might add. Okay, so we have some sinners. And then there are another, there's another type of person. Um, uh, and uh, these are type twos. And what, what type twos do is that they follow the crowd. Okay, these are people who are influenceable. Uh, they are people who are more likely to commit a crime um, if the people they know are committing crimes um, and less likely to do so if the people around them are not. Okay, so what is the particular model of influence that, that, that uh, um, you know, Ed Bruce and Jose do in this paper? Um, uh, they assume that everybody looks to their left. And if the person on their left is committing a crime, they're going to commit a crime too. Okay, so look at that little red dot um, on the slide and look at the black dot just to the left of it. There's an arrow, follow the arrow to the, um, uh, to the black dot to the left. The interpretation is that the black dot is a type two and he is influenced by the uh, person on his right, right? So the arrow points to the person that you influence, okay? The arrow points to the person, the, to the dot that each dot influences. Everybody influences the person on their left. Everyone is influenced by the person on their right. Okay, that's the story. So this is really trivial, okay? Um, so what are the actions that people take? You can either be good and not commit a crime, that's action zero, or you can commit a crime, that's action one. So this is all there is to the model, okay? Um, uh, so actually we should go back and look at that picture back computer back okay my computer's not keeping up okay so if we look at that red dot okay and now we follow along we see that the person that the red dot influences is a black dot it's a type 2 so the black dot person is going to commit a crime can you actually see my cursor i can't tell can you see my yes you can okay so this guy here okay is going to commit a crime because he is influenced by the red dot what about this person here Okay, well, this person is also a type two. He is influenced by the person on his right. And that person is a crime committer, right? So this person is gonna commit a crime as well. Now we move one step to the left and now we find a saint, okay? So she's not gonna commit a crime because she's a saint, okay? And now if we were to continue on and if this were a black dot over here, the black dot would be a saint as well, would not commit a crime because the person influenced by our saint doesn't commit a crime. If this were a red dot, we'd have another crime. And if it were a blue dot, we would have no crime by virtue of having another, another saint, okay? That's how the model works. So you can see that what we're gonna get out of this is from some in initial distribution of saints and sinners in the population, we're gonna get these chains of saints, or this in this case, a chain of sinners here, and we might get a chain of saints down there, okay? So there's gonna be a lot of correlation across individuals going on in this model. This is positive correlation, okay? So let's define pi to be the probability that somebody is an assigned type, which is to say either a saint or a sinner, right? Um, uh, their afterlife has already been determined, okay? Then we have, um, uh, uh, now, uh, what we're interested in, a key variable for us is going to be the expected distance between agents. So if a given individual is a saint, how long a chain of saintly behavior does that person kick off, right? If another person is a criminal, how long a chain of criminality does she kick off, okay? So what is that expected length of that chain? We can compute this, okay? Um, because, um, um, well, I've done the calculation here, and I think what I'm going to do in this talk is not actually talk my way through calculations. You can go back and look at these calculations um, on your own. Um, uh, the, the point is that this actually is, 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 is uh, recursive. Um, um, 
uh, the way I asked this question was suppose that we start from a committed type and we ask that, you know, what is the, what is the uh, probability um, of, uh, uh, or so what is the expected length of a chain starting from a committed type? Well, with, with, with probability P2, which is actually one minus pi, um, the, the next person is an uncommitted type. And so we add one to the length of the chain. And then we ask, what is the expected length of the chain coming off from that person? Because these chain lengths are independent, okay? And, um, uh, and this gives, a, and then with probability one minus two, we have a committed type and so the, uh, a committed type. And so the chain ends. This gives us a recursive relationship for the expected length of a chain. Um, and that um, turns out to be this number one minus pi over pi, which is the ratio of uncommitted, the, the, the ratio, uh, the odds ratio of, um, of uh, uncommitted types to committed types. Okay, and we see that if we have very, very few committed types, if the fraction of the population that is committed to being either a saint or a sinner is small, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a large number, okay? Now, the bottom of the slide has uh, a bunch of, um, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, undergraduate probability questions, okay? What is the expected action for any individual? Well, you take any individual, if that person is a committed type, um, uh, uh, the probability of, uh, of being um, uh, co conditional on being committed, uh, committed type, the probability of committing a crime, a crime is P1 divided by P0 plus P1. That is the probability of being a criminal type divided by the probability of being some kind of committed type, okay? Now, suppose that you're an uncommitted type, okay? The conditional probability of being, um, the probability again of committing a crime um, is uh, given that you're an uncommitted type is going to be the probability of the, per, uh, of the, of the committed type that you are connected to. And the, prob right, the probability that the committed type that you're connected to is going to commit a crime. And that again is P1 over P0 plus P1. And so the expected um, uh, criminality for any individual is P1 over P0 plus P1. But what's really interesting is, is so, so if we know that, we can compute the variant, we can compute um, uh, the average of criminality in our horizontal city of size 2n plus 1. Um, and that is the, uh, um, um, and, and, and what I've expressed on the, on, actually what I've expressed on the left, uh, on the right, Sn is not actually the sum of the criminalities, but it's the sum of the deviations of the mean from criminal behavior, okay? Um, so um, uh, in a large population, um, this, uh, this number should converge to zero, okay? All right, so by the, this is the strong law of large numbers, it applies here. Um, and so um, um, we see that, uh, um, uh, so this is straightforward, okay? What's interesting though, is to look at the variance around the mean. So how do we do that? We look at the, um, um, the sums of the normalized distant, we look at the sums of the deviations from the mean and we normalize them, um, the square deviations of the mean, we normalize them in some way. Um, and actually there is a central limit theorem that works here um, that the, uh, uh, the square root of 2n plus one times the, the um, average deviations, in fact, converges to a normal, a normal random variable with mean zero and some variance. And you have to compute that variance, right? And it's not just the variance of the individual terms now because um, uh, these terms are all, all the, the terms in the sum are all correlated, okay? But if you actually work it out, if you don't remember, you can go and you can look up um, uh, the formula for computing variances of sums when you have correlated random variables. And it works out to be, um, the bottom line is the key, um, uh, that the sum, uh, the variance is going to be P times one minus P. P times one minus P is what you would expect, right? If everybody were an independent actor. So it's P times one minus P times one plus two times the expected chain length. If the expected chain, if everybody is independent, right? If, there, if, if, if everybody is either a saint or a sinner and there's none of the social interaction effect, right, then the expected chain length is zero. And this is P times one minus P, which is the calculation that we've all remembered almost since birth, okay? Um, 
but as the chain length grows, you can see that the variance increases. Okay, and this is the point of, Sass of Blazer, Sassadot, and Shepard's paper. So then what they did was they actually, um, and I don't think I do that on this slide, no. Um, so um, uh, what they then did was to go and look at, at variances and estimate what the variances should be if everybody were independent actors from all these different data sets having to do with American crime statistics. Um, and then they looked at, therefore, the excess variance and then computed what the expected degree of social interaction was. They could compute this expected chain length. Okay. They actually didn't post their analysis in terms of the chain length. They talk about pi all the time. But talking about the chain length is actually, I think, a more sensible thing to do. And they essentially could back this out from what they did. Um, uh, and then, and then to, they wrote another paper where they said, so this might seem like a flaky way to do stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a lot of different phenomena where we have a lot of data. And there are things where we obviously think that social interaction effects are going on and other things where they're not. And we will use our methodology of computing the, um, um, the expected social interaction multiplier. Um, and then they, they, they backed it out for all of this different stuff. And they saw in this list of 25 or 30 different phenomena that, um, uh, that um, uh, the results largely coincided with intuition. That things that we had, um, 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 uh, uh, have big social interaction effects or had in fact a very small pie, okay, very large chain lengths, and uh, things for which we wouldn't expect there to be social interactions, in fact, had very large pies, very small chain lengths. So they claim across these two papers that this very, very ad hoc methodology um, uh, was, uh, um, um, is, is suggestive of something that's going on. And, um, uh, and, and of course it is. So this is, this is a, I think it's a, you know, you could never publish a paper. You could only publish a paper like this if it was the very first paper in a field, okay? The very first people to do this um, can get away with stuff like this, but you cannot, and I cannot, right? That moment is gone, at least for this topic, okay? Um, they were not the first guys, by the way, to, in, to, 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 to measure social interaction effects. It's even a paper in 1978 that did this, Linda Datcher did this in 1987 with some, I think it was with some some edu some kind of public good stuff or maybe it was education, I don't recall which. Um, but, um, uh, but this is the paper that really kind of focused on what is it that, that uh, social interactions do for us. Now in this model, of course, it turns out that the social interactions don't affect the mean, but it does affect the variance. There is a technique uh, which is used today for, um, uh, estimating uh, social interaction models. Um, it was developed by Brian Graham, who's an econometrician at Berkeley, and it's called the variance contrast method. And the variance contrast method of estimating social interactions is an immediate descendant of this paper. Okay. Um, all right. Having said that, let us now move on. So we're going to talk about, about, this is maybe a good moment to stop and ask if there are any questions lower right? Anyone? No questions. Then let me move forward. How are we going to model social interactions? Well, you can get a hint of that by looking at the, at the paper we just talked about. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a rather trivial example of a network. Um, and one way of modeling social, probably the way of modeling social interactions developed by, um, by a sociologist used by economists um, is to think about, about um, uh, networks as graphs of particular kind. Um, these little pictures with little nodes, little, little black dots, and then little arrows coming out of them, uh, connecting people up. Um, and uh, oftentimes questions that we are interested in are questions on the order of how does the topology of the social network affect the outcome in question, okay? Um, and we're gonna talk for a little bit about how we first, uh, abstractly about how we can talk about networks. And then we'll talk a little bit about what social networks actually look like. And then we will use them in an economic model or two, depending upon how much time we have, okay? That's our plan. So now let's talk, we're gonna talk about graphs, okay? Um, so what are graphs? Graphs are little dots with, with lines between them. Um, the dots are called uh, nodes or vertices. 
and the lines between them are called edges. There are, generally speaking, two kinds of graphs, actually more, but really for our purposes too. There are um, graphs which uh, are undirected graphs. You'll notice that these graphs have no arrows on the lines connecting up the dots, right? So these are all undirected graphs, both the uh, one on the left and the one on the right. On the other hand, the graph in the um, Glazer, Sasserdot, and Checkman model uh, was a directed graph because it had arrows. And the arrows in that case indicated something socially important, namely the direction of influence, okay? So we're gonna talk about both directed and undirected graphs. Um, uh, and now I'm gonna give you, we're gonna have a little introduction to um, graph theory, which is to say the language that we're gonna use to talk about graphs. Um, and this is a little boring, um, but I think we need it to kind of go forward. You need it to read the literature. Uh, and um, so uh, let's just get it out of the way as quickly as we can. And I am gonna move quickly because since you have access to this stuff, um, you'll be able to come back and look at it more on your own. And maybe this is a good moment for me um, to uh, say that there are, um, three really good books um, that you should pay um, attention to if you're interested in social networks. Um, and I'm actually looking for my copies so that I can hold them up because I am, um, uh, I am in my office. Um, however, um, my bookshelf has a lot of books and I don't know where they are and I don't really wanna take the time to look. Okay, so there are three. There is a book by Sanjeev Goyal who did his PhD at Cornell, actually. Um, and in his PhD thesis, wrote about social networks, published it in Econometrica. Um, and he is now a, a professor at Cambridge. Um, and he wrote a book called Connections. Uh, Connections, exclamation point, okay? Um, and that's a very good book. Um, another book, uh, which is a bit more comprehensive, came out a couple of years later, is by Matt Jackson. And I, th I think it's called something like The Economics of Social Networks, but I'm not really sure. Uh, and then there's a book that came out several years after that. And this, I think, is really the best book. Um, it is the broadest book in terms of coverage. Um, it is by an economist and a computer scientist. Um, the economist is David Easley. Um, and the economist, and the, that's the economist. And the computer scientist is John Kleinberg. And the book is called Networks crowds and markets, okay? Title was invented by the economist's wife who is a very famous finance professor. Okay, so um, uh, the, um, that is a, a, a bigger book than the other two. Um, and, um, uh, and I think it, it, it is um, interesting because it talks a lot about sociology um, as well as economics. Um, and, um, uh, and, and uh, talks about both theory and applications. It's so I, you know, if I were to choose one, that would be mine, um, but all three of them have their virtues, okay? Um, so let's talk about, um, about uh, uh, graphs. So, so we have a node, let's look at node B in the, well, let's look at node C, okay? Um, in the graph on the uh, left, um, uh, C is a node, it has one edge coming out of it. So we say that it is of degree one, all right? If we look at, at uh, node C in the picture on the right, we now see two edges coming out of it. Um, and so we say that C in that graph is of degree two. Degree measures the number of, of um, edges attached to a node. Okay, um, when we talk about directed graphs, we actually have to talk about two kinds of degrees. How many edges are pointing in to the node and how many edges are pointing out? So we talk about in degree and out degree, okay? Um, so what is a path? Okay, it's pretty obvious what a path is. Um, a path in a graph is that we follow edges from one node to another node. So you can see in the graph on the right, a path from C to B to D. If we have a directed graph, paths follow the arrows, okay? So you can't go backwards, you can only go forward, so to speak. Um, um, and we're also always very interested in paths because what's interesting in social networks is how people, not how people are directly connected to other people, but how people are indirectly connected 
right? So um, how many of you have heard the phrase six degrees of separation? Um, so so um, it is a fact about the social world that, that, that um, you know, that we are, we are all, you know, in, we are all connected um, through social networks um, through a rather small number of edges, right? So for example, um, um, uh, if you, you know, you're all economics graduate students at universities, um, uh, I might even know professors that, that you um, have studied with so that the degree is two, okay? Uh, between us, the path, I'm sorry, the path length is two between us. Um, but what's almost certainly true is that I know um, either their thesis advisors um, or you know, people in the departments of their thesis advisors, um, or maybe, you know, um, people in, uh, you know, the thesis advisors of some of the other people in your university who know your professors, okay? So that, that suggests that the path length between us, the length of the path between us is really only maybe three or four, okay? Um, and so um, uh, uh, there, there was a very famous mathematician whose name was Paul Erdos. I don't know if any of you know this name. Um, and um, this guy was the world's most prolific mathematician. Um, he actually didn't really have a home. He would just move. And I don't think he had a university appointment anywhere. He would just, but he's very, very famous guy. I mean, because he did really good work. Um, uh, and we'll be talking about Erdos Renyi random, random graphs in just a little bit. And he moved from house to house, staying at the homes of mathematicians. And every home he stayed at, he wrote a paper. Okay. And so people in mathematics like to talk about their Erdos number, which is, um, how many, how many in, in, in the graph of co-authorships, right? Where, where, where nodes are mathematician and edges, there's an edge between two mathematicians if they co-authored a paper. How long is the shortest path from that, you know, a given mathematician to Paul Erdos, right? Um, and people are, you know, very proud of the fact that their Erdos numbers are, you know, are small. It turns out, by the way, that I'm an economist, but my Erdos number is three. Okay, and 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 so, um, you know, this just goes to show that social networks are really, in some sense, very connected, even though, you know, we, we don't really know that many people. So this is kind of a puzzle about social networks. Why do they look? Why do they look this way? Um, uh, what do I mean by shortest path? Shortest paths have another name. They're called geodesics. A geodesic is the shortest length path connecting any two nodes. And how do we measure length? We count the number of edges, okay? Um, a subset of vertices is connected if there is a path between any two of them, okay? So here we have a graph containing eight nodes. Um, and uh, vertices one, two, three, and four are connected. Five, six, seven, and eight are connected. Okay, um, uh, one, two, three, and four is an example of something called a component of a graph because it is a group of connected vertices that is maximal with respect to the property of being connected. So one and three is a connected set of vertices, but there are more vertices that are connected to them, namely two and four. Right. So the set one and three is not maximal with respect to being connected. Um, but one, two, three, and four is, so it is said to be a component. Five, six, seven, and eight is another component, right? It is again, a connected set of vertices, which is maximal with respect to the property of being connected. And it has an additional property. And that is that every node in this component is directly connected, not indirectly, but directly connected to every other component. So one and four are only indirectly connected, but Everything, five, six, seven, and eight, each one of them is directly connected to everything else. Uh, components with that properties are called cliques, C-L-I-Q-U-E, okay? Uh, and you'll find, by the way, that this terminology is standard, standardized to a level of about maybe somewhere 65%, which means that you'll find, say, 35% of papers using clique in different ways, um, and so on and so forth. So you have to read carefully. Drawing pictures is a really bad way of trying to represent anything that's really complicated. And we'll see some examples of that later on. So we need some way of representing graphs that is you know, maybe easy to manipulate numerically. Um, one such way 
um, is something called an adjacency matrix. Um, sociologists who've been using them before, you know, for a very long time, call them social matrices. An adjacency matrix or a social matrix is a, um, a matrix which has numbers, which is square matrix with rows and columns, numbers of which are equal to the number of vertices um, in, the, um, um, in the graph. And every, uh, uh, every row corresponds to a vertex and every column corresponds to a vertex. So what do we do? Um, if vertex A and ver or vertex V and vertex W are connected, then we put uh, uh, a one in the VW element of the matrix. Otherwise we put a zero, okay? So I've drawn the, um, uh, the, the picture of this eight node graph on the left and I put the adjacency matrix for it on, on the right. And you can see that it has this property of having a, um, uh, a zero for um, uh, things that are not, uh, for, for pairs that are not connected and ones for pairs that are. How do you know that the five, six, seven, eight is a clique? If you look at this, you'll see that the only zeros are on the diagonals, okay? Um, uh, by the way, there is some application of graphs that allow for self-connections. And there are also uses for graphs that allow, that allow for multiple connections. And, and, and those are called multigraphs and we won't talk about them. Um, all right, so these are adjacency matrices. Um, uh, we might also um, sometimes want, give our edges an additional property. We'll talk about the strength of a connection, okay? Um, uh, do you influence me a lot or do you influence me a little? And so we'll indicate that by a weight. Um, and in that case, we'll have a weighted adjacency matrix rather than just a plain old adjacency matrix. Okay, everybody get the idea? Now, it turns out um, that uh, when we're talking about models of social influence, we you know, always have weighted adjacency matrices where the weights are all non-negative, okay? So you might ask, well, you know, why don't we have matrices where there are negative weights? Maybe it is the case that person one really hates person two in the graph up there. And so the one, two link should be negative. These guys hate each other. If, 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 if one says potato, then two says tomato, right? If one eats an apple, the two eats an orange, okay? Um, if one goes to sleep, then two wakes up. All right, and they always do opposite things. They influence each other in opposite directions. Um, we don't have a lot of theory about that, okay? Um, and so um, it might be interesting to think about situations where people simultaneously positively influence some and negatively influence others. I think there's a lot of research opportunities here simply because um, uh, there hasn't been much work done. There must be low hanging fruit as the saying goes, okay? Um, so here is a, 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 uh, a social network, okay? Uh, I have to explain this picture, okay? There is a, a red dot at the center, okay? And then there are all these little dots on the outside, okay? And there is a, um, a, a, a directed edge going from um, uh, the center out to every dot on the outside on the circle. So that's like a spoke. There's also an edge that comes in from, the, um, uh, from each little dot on the outside on the rim coming back in and hitting the center. Now, I really couldn't draw that in a very clean way. So I chose to draw the picture this way where the arrows kind of meet up in the middle, okay? Um, this is a graph of a celebrity network, okay? The person in the center is a celebrity. And all of these things going out, these black edges going out to her fan base, okay, um, have a lot of weight, okay? Because celebrities really influence their fans, right? On the other hand, you know, um, uh, coming back in, the red edges have very, very small weights because the celebrity at the center is influenced by the aggregate of her fans, but no one fan has a lot of influence, right? Okay. So, so someone named their favorite, no, you're all gonna be embarrassed if I ask somebody to name their favorite singer, okay? Um, 
So I won't ask, okay? I used to look at my audience and then have pictures that I would put up, okay? I don't remember, um, there was some famous Taiwanese singer uh, that I used to use when I lectured in Guangzhou. Um, and I would put up a picture of him and everyone would go, oh, because everybody loved him, right? And then in, 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 when I lecture in the United States, I talk about Taylor Swift, whose voice I hate, um, and she influences me negatively, which is why I'm interested in negative graphs. Okay, but um, but this is but you know but this is the way that celebrities really work, right? There's a lot of influence going out, you know, little bits of influence coming back in, and we can and we can capture that in this in this graph. So this is an example of using a graph to describe a social situation. Okay, um, so now let's get to the mathematics. Okay. Um, if we multiply adjacency matrices, um, we get interesting things. So now let's forget about weighted adjacency matrices, okay? And let's go back to unweighted matrices. So every element of the adjacency matrix A is either zero or one, okay? Um, so uh, when we look at the matrix A squared, what is this telling us, okay? So uh, uh, if we look at the IJ element of A squared, um, it is this expression on the right of the equality, it is the sum over k of aik times akj. Now notice that if either one of those terms, aik or akj, is equal to zero, then the product is equal to zero. So a given aik times akj term is equal to one if and only if both of those terms are one, which is to say that there's a path from a to k, and then there's a path from k to j. Okay, so when we sum over all k, what are we getting? We are getting the number of paths of length two that go from i to j. Can everybody see that? All right, so guess what happens if you look at a cubed and a to the power four? Okay, now um, um, we can, of course, also do this with weighted uh, uh, adjacency matrices, right? And then what we have is the um, you know, is the uh, kind of the, the, the total weight of the influence um, along length two paths of influence of I on J, okay? Okay. So graphs are really large things, right? Think about a graph of, of um, uh, you know, social networks on the campuses at which you live and work, okay? This is a very large social network. Um, we can't even write down the adjacency matrix, matrix for this. So there must be some network statistics that we would wanna compute to try and get a handle on what graphs might look like. So here's a list of them. We might care about, for example, um, uh, graph diameter, which is the maximal geodesic length, right? So, um, you know, you, 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 for every, for every, for every um, pair of nodes, we say that the distance between them is the length of the geodesic connecting them, the length of the shortest path connecting them. What is the maximal distance between any two nodes? Okay. Then we might say, we might say, uh, think of the experiment of drawing two nodes at random and measuring the path, you know, the path, the shortest path, but length of the shortest path between them. That would give us the mean geodesic length. Another thing we're interested in is immediate connectivity properties. So we might ask after the, you know, what the, how do degrees behave? So we might look at the dis distribution of degrees. What fraction of nodes are, have degree one? What fraction of nodes have degree 10? What fraction of nodes are unconnected? Which is to say they're not connected to anybody else in the graph, have degree zero, okay? Here's another thing that we might wanna measure. This is more, comes out of uh, thinking about, about social phenomena. There is a saying that the friend of my friend is my friend too, okay? I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. Um, I actually, you know, I read this in some network science book, but I'd never heard of it. What I know is that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, okay? That's very different, okay? We don't have that here, okay? But it is a fact, okay, um, that if I discover that a and B are friends, and C and D are C, B and C are friends. That it is more likely than not that A and C are friends as well. Okay, um, so how might we measure this? So we will call a triad. We'll use the word triad to describe 
three vertices, A, B, C, where A is connected to B and B is connected to C, okay? We will say that that triad is closed if there is also an edge connecting A directly to C so that it forms a triangle, okay? The clustering coefficient of a graph is the fraction of triads that are closed. Now, what is this, what is this idea of, of, of closed triads represent? If A is a friend of, if, let me say it right. If B is a friend of A and C is a friend of B, then C is a friend of A. So what it's suggesting is that, is that, is that, is that maybe friendship is a, transitive net, is a transitive relationship. Now, of course, you know, we all have, you know, friends of friends who are not friends of ours, right? You know, because we're friends in different ways or, you know, through different, different, you know, social milieus or something like that. Um, so, so uh, the clustering coefficient is a measure of the degree of transitivity, which is inherent in the relationship that the graph represents. Okay. Another thing we might look at, uh, components. We saw that um, we looked at a graph that had two components early on. If we have a large graph, it's, you know, typically might have very many components. And we might ask how big are these components and what do we know about the distribution of sizes of components? And we can often compute these things or estimate these things. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this. Um, uh, of course, we're ultimately gonna to wanna to do statistics with graphs. And so we're gonna need graphs to be in some sense random. So we need to have random graphs, okay? Um, and uh, random graphs provide a framework for inference about these statistics. Now, random graphs are actually easy to think about. Think about the following. Um, suppose that you know, we can represent every graph by a weighted adjacency matrix, right? We all agree. Now, what is a weighted adjacent? You know that a matrix of dimension, you know, an n by n matrix is really just a big vector of dimension n squared. Okay. So if I put a probability distribution on vectors of length n squared, what I'm really doing is putting a probability distribution on weighted graphs of, of with n agents, with n individuals, with n nodes. Make sense? Yes, no, maybe. Since I can describe graphs by numbers, since I can precisely describe a graph by a large collection of numbers, right? I can put probability distributions on them, right? There's more intuitive stories about, 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 about how you um, can get random graphs. So here's, a, here's one intuitive story that we'll be talking about in just a minute. I have a, um, 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 I take node number one. And then I, I take node number two and I flip a coin. If it comes up heads, I draw an edge between them and I don't. Then I take node number three, okay? And I flip a coin. Uh, if it comes up heads, I draw a one three edge. Otherwise I don't, so on and so forth. Then I go to two. I'm gonna do this undirected. So I've already got one taken care of. So I start flipping coins for three, four, and five. And then I go to node three and I do the same thing. And at the end of the day, what do I have? I have a graph. I've just described a data generating process that looks a lot like Bernoulli random variables, which has given us a random graph. Not surprisingly, these things have a name and that name is Bernoulli random graphs, okay? Uh, because the edges are all um, um, uh, incidents of um, uh, uh, realizations of independent um, uh, Bernoulli random variables, okay? Uh, or we could do it with, with, with weights if you wanted, same thing, but we're not gonna talk about those. Graph, so if we're gonna talk about probabilistic models of graphs, we're actually talking about graph generation in some sense. We're talking about a data generating process for describing graphs. Um, there are models out there that are designed to be purely descriptives, uh, purely descriptive of graphs. There are things called stochastic block models, exponential random graphs. These are, are are random graph models that have been designed to make it easy to estimate some of the measures that we're interested in. If you're interested in doing descriptive graph theory, um, describing social networks, these are important things. Um, and if you, if you start reading in applications of, of, of uh, social networks and sociology um, in particular, but also a bit in economics, you'll see some of these different kinds of random graphs. 
There are also structural models, which is to say models of network formation. How do, how do random, how do social networks come about, right? Um, well, some of them are given, you know, kind of just given to us, you know, we're, we're born into a family, right? That's kind of an exogenous event, okay? But other times, you know, we, we cultivate friendships, right? Because these friends and, you know, we're all interested in some same things, you know, we're all interested in, and, you know, maybe I want to, we'll talk about this later on, I want to look for a job. So I start cultivating friendships uh, among people who might know about jobs that would be good for me, so on and so forth, okay? Um, so we have, uh, we have strategic random graph models um, or strategic graph formation models. Now it turns out you might say, well, why don't we do game theory for this? And we'll come back and talk about this if there's time. Um, game theory has not really been very successful at this because there are about an infinite number of different models that you could think of for generating, you know, for which, for which you know, there are an infinite number of games you could think of, the outcome of which would be a social network, okay? And um, the small details of how the networks get constructed matter a lot for the aggregate properties. So things that you might have heard about, like pairwise Nash stability, uh, for instance, don't actually have that much bite, okay? Um, and that's just frustrating. That's the state of the art at the moment. And if you're a theorist, it might be fun for you to think about. Um, skip that, okay. Um, let's talk about um, the, uh, uh, an, some, an interesting random graph. Um, that has a property that um, we will, that exhibits properties that are, excuse me, because I'm really, I have a cold, by the way. Um, also, good for you that you're at the other end of a Zoom connection because I'm actually quarantined, okay? Um, and I am quarantined because I have a cold and because um, until the results of my COVID test comes back, we don't know whether it's the cold or COVID. That result is taking so long that my cold is almost gone, okay? Um, but I am still officially in quarantine until I um, get the result. Now I did sneak out of my home to come to my office to be here because it's easier to do this in the office than at my house. But um, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I still have the effects of the cold and I'm losing my voice and I'm kind of, you know, um, I took a pill, so concentration is a little bit fun. Uh, and so who knows what I'll say by the end of the evening. So um, these, uh, let's get back to erdos rendi random graphs, which are ways, um, which, which have properties that we see in a lot of other social networks, and it's interesting to explore. So let's think about the Bernoulli random graphs that I was talking about. So remember, how do we get every edge of a Bernoulli random graph? We look at a pair, of nodes, and then we take a realization of a Bernoulli random variable, okay? And um, if we have, um, um, uh, if we have um, N, let's do it, we're doing this with an undirected graph. If we have N nodes, we have N choose two pop pop possible edges, okay? And so for every one of them, we draw a Bernoulli random variable. And if it's one, we draw the edge. If it's zero, we don't, okay? So now, um, uh, so let's now ask what happens if we were to make this graph very, very large. Let's increase the size of N. We'll leave P, the probability that the edge is realized, we'll leave that fixed, okay? If we let N get large and we realize, and we keep P fixed, here comes a test question. Everybody has to answer, okay? What is the expected degree? So for every possible edge that I could have, okay, I'm gonna flip a coin with probability P, I'm gonna get a heads and I'm therefore gonna draw the edge with probability one minus P, I'm gonna get a zero, I'm gonna not draw the edge, okay? So if we have N, N nodes, how many nodes, and, and I'm one of the N nodes, how many nodes are there for me to connect to? Okay, you can't say this very easily. None of you at least want to volunteer, right? Okay, this would not be true in an American classroom. Everybody would be volunteering, right? Except for the foreign students, okay? Um, so if, if uh, there were, there were um, uh, you know, there, if, if there are N edges, 
and I am one of the n edges, right? There are n minus one other edges, right? Okay. And the probability that I connect to each one of those n minus one other, other edges is p. So the expected number of edges that I have is n minus one times p, correct? We all agree? You all got that. You were just too shy to say it, right? Okay. Now, the thing about this is that n minus one times p, right, grows to infinity as n gets large. Okay. The striking thing about social networks is that n is very large. Okay. Most of us don't really have very connect, you know, many connections. How many of you think that you have, say, 20 good friends? I'm not talking about acquaintances, I'm talking about good friends, right? Okay. Um, so um, yeah, so 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 that doesn't seem like a good model for a large social network. So now let's perform another experiment. Okay. Let us let us su suppose that we think that in our social network, the average degree is five. Okay. So let's let n get large and simultaneously shrink p so that n minus one times p is equal to five. Okay. All the time. Now, this should remind you of something. This should remind you of how we derive Poisson random variables from limits of Bernoulli random variables. Right. This is exactly what we do in the the, you know, this is exactly how we get the Poisson approximation to Bernoulli random variables, right? We let, we get, we let, so Bernoulli distribution is described by, by n coins and the probability P of a success, right? And so what we do is we let n get large, we let P get small so that n times P converges to a constant, right? And that gives us the Poisson distribution, okay? So the random graph, so now what I'm going to do is the same thing here. I'm going to get let n get very large. I'm going to get p, let p get very small so that n p times n minus one converges to a constant. Okay. And now I'm going to ask what do these graphs look like for um, a large n? Okay. So there are, there are two um, names for these things. Um, they're called Erdos Renyi random graphs, two Hungarians, of course. And there's that guy Erdos again. Um, and uh, uh, they're also called Poisson random graphs for obvious reasons, okay? So um, it turns out that the behavior, what these large end graphs look like, depends critically on whether the limit, which I've called Z in this graph, in this slide, is greater than or less than one. If it's less than one, if the mean degree is less than one, okay, then, we're gonna have a lot of small components. The picture you should have is a large archipelago of islands, many, many islands floating around in the sea. And the island size are all exponentially distributed. And the islands with, with as n gets large, the islands grow at rate log, the size of the largest island grows at late rate log m, okay? Everybody got that? Now, what's really cool, okay, is that if Z is greater than one, we get a different picture. A continent emerges out of the sea. We get a, what is called a giant connected component, the giant connected component. The giant connected component grows at rate N, not log N, but at rate N as the graph gets, as N gets large, okay? Now, when Z is very near one, the fraction of nodes that are on part of the continent is very, very small, okay? Um, when Z is very large, of course, the fraction um, uh, becomes much larger, okay? And, and, and that's what this picture on the right is, is supposed to demonstrate. If you can read it, um, uh, we have Z in the horizontal axis, and we have the fraction of the population in the giant component on the vertical axis. And you can see that is that a Z gets, it's, it's pretty much flat until we cross one and then it starts taking off, okay. Now, um, uh, I say the giant connected component because it is true that um, uh, uh, this is a probability one statement that there'll be a, um, 
you have to build the right probability space in order for this to make sense, okay? But if you do it, okay, you get the result um, that the giant connected component is unique. There's only one, okay? Now, in order to, you know, so let's not think really about what that means, but um, I mean, you, you have to talk about actually growing something as n gets large, but there's only gonna be one component that grows as n gets large at rate n, okay? And all the other small components, by the way, are gonna grow at rate log n. And then you'll get more and more and more of them, of course. Okay, um, so that's kind of, this is a, an, an interesting phenomena of graphs. And you see, by, you see this, by the way, in many, many other graphs, this emergence of a single gigantic cluster, a single gigantic com, you know, component, um, and, and then lots of other little components that you know, may or may not end up getting connected. And we'll see some examples of this um, in just a bit. Um, uh, this also illustrates, uh, you know, that um, something that um, uh, that you've learned in other classes to call uh, critical behavior, uh, and 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 uh, or phase transition is another word that is used. That as a parameter crosses a particular boundary, the behavior of the phenomena in question changes dramatically. From having lots and lots of sea with lots and lots of little islands to having a continent that gets bigger and bigger, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. This is a qualitative change in behavior that happens as the parameter Z crosses one. So here's another model um, called preferential attachment. How many of you have written papers? You know. A uh, few of you have. All right, so um, uh, imagine yourself now, for those of you who have already experienced this phenomena, for those of you who haven't, this is something for you to worry about, okay? Who do you cite? You're going to send your paper off to a journal, probably the QJE, okay? You're going to send it off to a journal. And, 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 and you know, you, you, you can't cite every economist in the world because that's not serious. Um, uh, you certainly want to cite the papers you know, that are, um, you know, that you're arguing with and the papers that agree with you, if you're taking a stand in a debate. Um, and there might be key people whose papers you feel you have to cite, probably have to cite your thesis advisor's paper, right? Okay, so um, whether or not you ever read it, okay. Um, I'm not sure, by the way, that I cited my thesis advisor's paper in my thesis. My thesis advisor's big book. I'm not sure, um, but I might have. Um, that's really strange. Let's go back. Okay. Um, so um, here's a way. Here's a. So there is a um, a phenomena that goes like this. The, it says the graphs are like citation. Think about citation networks. Citation networks grow. Okay. Um, as more and more people write papers, and in the citation network, it's a directed network, we will say that there is an edge from A to B if person, if paper A cites paper B, okay? Um, and um, so um, let's imagine the following model, okay? Um, on the one hand, you want to cite, you know, papers that are recent and useful to what you're working on, but it's also important to write, to cite the important papers, okay? But what are the important papers? The important papers are the papers that have the most cites, okay? So if I, if I um, you know, hold up a, um, uh, a, uh, uh, a paper in front of you, the probability that you are going to cite that paper depends to some degree, um, at least in part, on uh, how many citations it already has. And if it has more citations, that probability is gonna go up, right? If you, if you build processes that construct networks that way, okay, you get, um, uh, a, you get families of graphs, which are known as preferential attachment graphs, okay? They have the property that, that, that we all prefer to attach to some nodes over other nodes and we are most likely to attach to the popular nodes. Um, what you end up with, and there's a description in this, uh, on this slide of one such process, okay? Um, which comes from a paper by some computer scientists written in 2000. Um, what you get out of this 
um, our, um, uh, our uh, power law degree distributions. So do you know what power laws are, right? So if you think about a normal distribution, it has a tail that kind of thins out exponentially, right? So a power law, um, uh, power laws are distributions with tails that thin out more slowly. Like uh, they, they, like they, they thin out at, at like at rates like x to the minus two, or x to the minus three, or something like that. Um, and so power laws are kind of tricky because so on the one hand, a lot of things in the world are described by power laws. Power laws are what you would naturally reach if you studied multiplicative processes, the same way that you reach normal distributions if we study um, if we study additive processes. And um, uh, furthermore, power laws are, are, as I said, a little bit tricky um, because uh, you know power laws with coefficients, for example, between one, um, you know, with, with uh, I said, power laws with coefficients less, you know, with coefficient less than two, um, for example, uh, don't have means. With coefficient less than three, they don't have variances and so on and so forth. So um, you have, you know, typically you'll have the existence of only a finite number of moments and other higher order moments will be infinite. Um, so uh, there's a large literature on power laws. They've been used to model things like city size distributions and income distributions and stuff like this. Um, uh, one name that you see a lot in connection with power laws is Xavier Gabay. Um, he's written a lot on them, uh, having to do with income distributions and other things. You'll find his works um, you know, frequently in the AER and other places like that. Um, so these are things that you should get to know um, if you're interested in some of these topics. Okay, so here's... Um, pictures, but we don't really have time for pictures. So here, let's look at some real social networks, okay? So here, um, a couple of sociologists went into a, um, um, an American school and they, uh, and this was must, I think this was done back in the eighties. Um, uh, and they asked people, you know, who are you dating, right? Or who are you, you know, who's your partner? Um, and uh, of course, many people didn't have any, okay? Um, and what they did was they, they, they asked, who are your partners over the last six months, to be more precise, or the last term? Um, and out of that, then they constructed this, this, this graph where they've labeled, um, they've labeled nodes according to their gender, okay? And gender in those days was pretty simple, male and female, okay? Um, uh, blue and pink. Um, and they drew an edge between any two nodes if uh, they were, um, you know, connected over this six-month period. Um, and, you know, you can see that, gee, there were 63 pairs that were, you know, a couple that was coupled up and stable over the whole period, okay? Um, there were nine incidents of two guys that serially dated, or for all we know, jointly dated the same woman. Okay, that's here, okay. Notice that we have the giant connected component, okay. All these guys are connected, right? This is, the, this is what we mean by the giant connected component, okay. You'll notice that there are really very few people here like that have high degree. Here's a rather promiscuous person. Here's another one, okay. But there really aren't very many of them in this graph. Okay, maybe here's a here's one over here too. Okay, um, but nonetheless, even though we don't have a lot of people of very high degree, we nonetheless have this picture right with this gigantic component. Okay, here's another picture. This is a friendship graph. Okay, from a high school, which I believe is in Ohio. Um, actually, this is a middle school. I think this was like sixth and seventh graders or fifth and sixth graders, something like this. Um, the indices are colored by ethnicity. Uh, green are, are, uh, are black, uh, African-American. Um, yellow is Hispanic. I believe that pink is other, okay? So this is a high school that is populated mostly by, by Blacks and Hispanic individuals, Black and Hispanic students. And there's a few people who might be Asian or white or you know, Fiji Islander or whatever, okay? Pacific Islander, that's the phrase we use. Um, and uh, this graph is drawn um, in a way uh, that shows 
uh, one way to think about this is that um, higher nodes, uh, older people tend to be more located at the top and younger people are more located at the bottom. Okay, there is a science to drawing graphs, okay, in order to represent their features, because obviously I could throw these things around anywhere I wanted to. And so there are techniques, and you can read about these. And if you're ever going to work with social networks, you probably will read about them. Um, there are techniques for kind of displaying the structure of the relationships. And so here, what we see from this is that, is that people stratify both by age and by ethnicity. And that the interfaces across ethnic groups are really rather thin here, okay? You'll notice we have a few people here who don't claim to be connected at all, okay? We have other people where the friendships are all are one way, okay? So um, um, in any event, so, so this, this shows, again, what we can learn from this is that social networks um, are, 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 are really highly structured. Um, okay, we've talked about transitivity, so I think I'm going to skip this. And now we're up to talking about centrality, and this is a good time for a break. Okay, um, uh, we're going to talk about centrality in social networks, what it means to be central in a social network, something that no doubt we all want to be. And then um, we will uh, um, start talking about some applications of this to economic phenomena. All right. I have a question. It's pretty much practical. Um, mm. As I'm going to collect different forms of social network data in uh, 2022, uh, but I'm still novice. So, uh, well, normally when researchers are going to collect social network data, uh, we need to first confine the network within a certain community, like a natural village or a class, right? As we mentioned before. Um, but if we're talking about the Chinese context, if in my question there. Uh, well, well, it's like half of the rural residents are migrant workers. So if in my question there, I define social network uh, like uh, within the uh, natural village, then I'll definitely lose the urban side of social network. So um, I don't know if it's really problematic, but I would like to see if you have any comments about it. Well, I, I think that uh, it's hard to talk about that unless um, I mean, it really depends upon what you're studying, okay? Um, if you imagine that there are people, you know, who are um, both present in the village. So if you have people who are, you know, there are different kinds of migrants, right? So I've listened to a lot of talks on, on migrants in the Chinese context. And um, so you have some people who travel far away, right? And they're away for long periods of time and they leave their children for example, back in the village or something like that, unless, you know, because they don't have a, you know, the hukou or anything. Or um, uh, uh, on the other hand, you have people who maybe commute a bit more regularly. And so the question that you have to ask is, what social influences am I interested in measuring? If I'm interested, suppose, for example, I was interested in the health of migrants. And I know that these people, um, and I'm interested in, in um, what kind of health facilities do people take advantage of? And I'm interested in social network effects on that. Well, you know, the answer to that question would depend upon both people at the migrant's place of work and at the migrant's home. On the other hand, if I'm interested in, you know, in looking at parents who are educating children who are or leaving parents with children, if parents leaving children behind, okay, um, I might more be interested be interested in more in the village network. I think your question your research question determines the relevant network. Whether you can then collect the data for that is a different question, okay? So, I mean, clearly it's gonna be the case that if your question requires that you sample people, social networks at places, you know, all over the country, that's not gonna work, right? I mean, you, you don't have yeah. the resources for that. Um, um, but, um, and if that's the case, you shouldn't try and get away with, doing what you want to do anyways, because it will just be kind of terrible. Um, you know, not through any fault of your own, right? But if you can't, you know, there are some questions that are just unresearchable with the data that we have access to. And I think that that we have to accept that as a fact of life. Um, but the specific answer to your question really is going to depend upon 
you know, what your research question is. But your research question tells you, you know what the natural social network is. The only question is, can you get the data for it or not? Right, so don't let, don't worry about what other people, you know, um, I would just start there, right? Who are the people who I would really want to survey? And then what percentage of them could I actually get to? All right, so we should, um, um, I'm, by the way, I, I think um, I am meeting with you all again tomorrow night, correct? Or some of you yes. at least. Some of you, right? Yeah. And, and this will be a time Me. to talk about that. Yeah. And I am, I am willing, by the way, to have some extra office hours if people would like to talk to me um, and, and, and are not able to kind of get into whatever's, whatever I'm supposed to be doing tomorrow night. Um, so, um, and, and I will talk with, with Kathy about how we can arrange that, all right? Um, and maybe we could have some more meetings early next week. Um, all right, so let us get back to, to this really cool topic. How important are you? Okay, that's, that's what we're gonna ask. How important are you? And again, I'm gonna ask all of you, know, those of you who can to turn, to show me your shining faces. Okay, it really, it really helps um, to, uh, I know you don't believe this, but you probably don't have the experience lecturing that I have. It is much easier to lecture to real people than it is to faces, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and I guarantee that all of you look more beautiful in person, more handsome, whatever, than these, you know, high school yearbook pictures that you're throwing up or whatever. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So um, let's talk about, about centrality. So what we would really like to know, uh, one question we would really like to know about social networks is who, who is important. And, um, uh, and can we, in fact, get at importance topologically? Are there, are there ways of looking at a network? Uh, who are central people on a network? This depends upon what we mean by centrality. Uh, you know, for example, who are the people who have the most, in, you know, the most influence in a social network? Um, that's one question. Who are the people who always seem to know what's going on? Who are the best at collecting gossip, so to speak, right? That's another, that's an, that might be a different person, okay? That's another kind of centrality. So there are different centrality questions, and consequently, there are many different ways of measuring centrality. Um, here, I've listed four measures. There are, in fact, more than that. Um, uh, one such measure is degree centrality. How many vertices can a vertex reach directly? Okay, so uh, the most central individuals, according to this, are the individuals with the, um, you know, with the, uh, with the highest degree, the most links to other people. Um, between this centrality, if we're interested in who is important for information flows within a social system, we might say, how likely is a vertex to be on the shortest path between two randomly chosen individuals? How likely is any given individual to be on that shortest path? Um, the person who is the most likely, right, is uh, in some sense, most central uh, for information flows. Related to that is something called closeness centrality, which is, which is related to the question, how fast can a vertex reach all vertices in the network? So I think one way of measuring this is to say, um, let us look at the maximal geodesic length coming out of an individual, okay? That's the farthest distance that you would have to travel from that individual to some person in the, in the network, okay? Now let us look for the person with the smallest maximal geodesic size or geodesic length, the smallest maximal geodesic length. That person can reach everybody in fewer steps than can anybody else in the network. That is the, that is the person who is closeness in terms of uh, closeness centrality. That is the person who is central in terms of closeness centrality. The final notion of centrality um, seems to be um, a bit um, ill-defined, but in fact, it's not. Who is the person who influences the most important people? How do we measure important? By influence, okay? Who is the person who most influences the biggest influencers? All right, so that sounds like it is recursive. Um, and it is recursive and it leads to 
um, uh, looking for eigenvectors of adjacency matrices, which is why it's called eigenvector centrality. This was introduced by a, uh, um, a sociologist um, uh, called, uh, whose name is Phil Bonasich. Um, and eigenvector centrality turned out to be very important. Um, uh, in John Kleinberg, you remember that I mentioned his name earlier in connection with the book Networks, Clouds, and Market. Um, he found it was very important for, for, for um, uh, designing efficient search algorithms um, for uh, internet, uh, for the web, okay, for looking at that. And, and, um, and this led directly to page length and therefore page rank and therefore to Google and other search engines that we know. So this is a very practical kind of thing. Um, and, and all, you know, many of the most modern search, um, uh, uh, you know, search sites today, like, you know, like Google, for example, they do many other things, but, but computing eigenvector centrality is part of, part of what they do um, or some, you know, things related to that. Um, oh, I forgot that I should mention to you another reason why I think that Easley and Kleinberg is the best book is because it is the one book that is legally free. Okay, if you go to either Easley or Kleinberg's webpage, um, you can actually download a PDF of the manuscript. Um, and uh, when they, uh, their book is published by Cambridge University Press, and when they negotiated their contract with Cambridge, they said they wanted free distribution on the web and for no doubt a penalty in royalties, uh, Cambridge allowed that. And uh, so you could get the book for free without having to go to your favorite Russian website. Okay. Um, so let's uh, see how we measure these different things. Um, it will be useful um, to uh, refer to, to use the, uh, the symbol E to refer to the vector of all ones. Because uh, if we do that, we can um, uh, sum rows or columns simply by uh, pre or post multiplication of a matrix A by E. So degree centrality, how many nodes can a node directly measure? We measure this by in degree, you know, how many arrows are coming in. Um, and this is just the, um, for individual J, just, this is just the sum of the entries in the Jth column of the adjacency matrix. It's the Jth col column sum. And so the vector, uh, the row vector of degree centralities is given by the vector E times the adjacency matrix A. Eigenvector centrality. Um, all right, so the idea is that centrality of node J is proportional to the sum of the centralities of the nodes that she influences, okay? So let's let, um, uh, there is a, 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 a typo, there should be a superscript E right where the little hand is, okay? Um, the right equation is over here. We see that, um, um, uh, and we might think about uh, A being a weighted adjacency matrix here, okay? It doesn't matter. Um, so um, uh, CI times AIJ um, is the degree to which, um, um, let's say this right, is the, um, uh, the degree to which J influences I, AIJ, that's the degree to which J influences I times CI, the influence, um, uh, the centrality influence of person I, okay? So we sum those all up for person J. We take that um, uh, and then we say that our vector of centrality should be proportional to that. Um, in vector terms, this leads to the equation on the right. And if you look at the equation on the right, You'll see that, well, what is this saying? This is saying that E is an eigenvector, a left eigenvector of the matrix A, and it is uh, with bonding uh, eigenvalue one over mu, okay? Do you all know what eigenvectors are? This is linear algebra. Um, uh, if you've studied some econometrics, I'm sure you know what they are because you do these eigenvector decompositions all the time. Um, and, uh, uh, and so this is, um, and if not, by the way, this is easy stuff to look up. You can find it in the last chapters of your linear algebra textbook, which I know you have all suffered through. Um, 
Okay. Um, now, um, obviously, we're interested in eigenvectors where the proportionality constant is positive. Um, and there is a theorem. It's called the Perron Frobenius theorem. In our context, it says that if the network is strongly connected, okay, uh, then there is a unique um, uh, scalar, which is positive, and a one-dimensional set of vectors, c greater than zero, that actually solve this eigenvector equation. Okay. Now, the, 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 the idea that the network is strongly connected is actually a statement about a linear algebraic, an algebraic property of the, uh, of the adjacency matrix. Namely, it's the property that says that if we take any two um, nodes, node i and node j, there is a power k such that the ij element of a to the power k is positive, which says basically, what does that say? Remembering what we talked about earlier, that says that, that i and j are connected by some path, okay? A path of some length k, okay? Um, uh, all right, so this is eigenvector centrality. And so you compute eigenvectors in order to find them. And they're typically, you know, for the matrices that we're talking about where A is non-negative, okay? And where it has this property um, um, uh, that everything can be reached from everything else. Um, so um, uh, such matrices, by the way, are called irreducible, okay? Um, you might you might have heard that term before. This is important in the theory of Markov chains for those of you who've ever studied Markov chains. Okay, this this is the theorem. One this is one theorem that guarantees the existence of an invariant distribution for a Markov chain. Okay, um, now um, uh, uh, so there is a whole you know there is a one dimensional you know the eigenspace um, uh, the space of, of of solutions to this equation. When we have the proper eigenvalue in here, um, it's a one-dimensional solution space. Um, and so we can choose any particular normalization we want, depending on the problem and what we want to do. We might, we might normalize them to have all the coefficients sum to one, or we might have all the coefficients sum to n, or there might be other things that we want to do. Um, okay. Uh, there's another kind of centrality. This is I mean, that another way of measuring. Here's a way of measuring closeness centrality. This is due to a guy named Leo Katz. In 1953, he wrote a paper. This paper is about as old as I am. Um, says that assume that A is uh, n by n and irreducible. Um, and, 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 you know, basically you can see, I don't want to talk through these formulas, but basically you can see that what we're doing is we're, suppose that, that A is a, uh, is, is a matrix of all zeros and ones. So what we're doing is counting path lengths when we're, you know, counting the number of, of paths that, that um, uh, uh, you know, that uh, uh, in this AK matrix, Right, we are we are we are um, counting the number of paths of length k. But then what we're doing is we're discounting the longer paths according to their lengths, so that longer paths count less than shorter paths. Okay, so this alpha is a discount factor. What we're really doing here is we're taking a present discounted value. So we're asking, you know, how many paths are there of length k um, uh, for person j when we take e times a k j? Okay. That's how many paths are there um, uh, that uh, along which of length k um, uh, at which, you know, along which uh, person j's influence is going, how many paths are there? And we discount that by the, by the length of the path at discount rate alpha. So this is a whole family of eigenvector, of, of, I'm sorry, a whole family of centralities. Um, this is not a very good measure. Um, it's a very good idea, but it turns out to be algebraically the wrong measure. And so on this slide and on the next slide, um, I have actually um, Im improved this measure uh, by doing a couple of different things. Um, um, one thing that is hard about this is that, um, uh, uh, that it doesn't count self-influence, okay? And you would want to count your own influence on yourself on this. Um, so you would really want to add one to all of these measures in some sense um, uh, as part of this. You're noticing we're, we're starting at k being greater than zero. You'd really want to start k being greater than or equal to zero. Another thing is, is that this, this, this is unbounded. 
<coughs> as alpha grows. Um, and this doesn't really matter so much if we want to just look at one matrix, but what we might want to do is to compare different matrices. And if we want to compare different matrices, we might want to fix alpha and then swap in different matrices. And you know, depending upon how we do that, we might get, you know, because of the fact that alphas are not normalized kind of from the top, so to speak, that they're unbounded, um, um, uh, it, it, it's just not a very satisfactory measure. Let me leave it at that. So one thing we would like to do is, 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 is to normalize these so that there's a natural maximum for what this thing could be. So one way of fixing all of this is to move from, forget the alpha on the bottom for a moment. Instead of taking a present discounted value, take an average discounted value. If you remember in your economic theory class, you studied repeated games. And when you studied repeated games and you studied the folk theorem, one of the things you did was you looked at present discounted values of utility streams. But present discounted values of utility streams um, can, are often not terribly comparable. I mean, they blow up to infinity as the discount factor gets very, very large. And of course, it's precisely at infinity that we want to study things. So we have the trick in game theory, and you saw this if your class covered repeated games, is taking the average discounted value, which says take the present discounted value at rate alpha and multiply that by one minus alpha. And it turns out that that's always finite, okay? Um, and so, um, uh, and that turns out to be the right thing to do in the folk theorem. And for similar reasons, it's the right thing to do here. And then if we divide by alpha, what we're now doing is where it turns out without going, you, the calculations are here, you can actually see them. Um, we're adding back in that missing k equals zero terms by doing that. Um, and so we get these modified cat centralities if we do this, which we call c tilde of k. Um, and I think these are really interesting. Um, because um, uh, they, they uh, give a continuum of interpretable centrality measures. So as alpha converges to one, we see that this converges to the um, eigenvector centrality. Um, this statement here is not exactly right. What's really true is that um, not as, if you look at the derivative of c tilde of k with respect to alpha, as alpha goes to zero, this converges to the degree centrality. So this actually relates these different centrality measures together. And it says that although we ask these different centrality questions, they're really all closely related to each other. And you know, we can tease out relations mathematically by looking at particular measures. But I think the thing to keep in mind is that the four motivations that I started with at the outset are really in fact somewhat close to each other and they're interrelated. Okay, um, and 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 uh, um, a homework problem for you to do not now but at home because it turns out that these modified cat centralities are really very useful. They pop up in a lot of contexts. Is you should you should compute some for a couple of graphs. And so here are some graphs you might try that on on your own um, over lunch. Okay, one more source of centrality, which is unfortunately called alpha centrality. Alpha centrality. Because uh, we already have used alpha a lot. Alpha, this is another thing by Phil Bonasic and by a PhD student of his back 20 years ago. Um, there are two sources of centrality that you can think about in a, in a social network. One is, you know, to whom are you connected? To whom are you, you know, are you related? Who do you relate to? And then second is, what do you bring to the table? You know, are you just kind of like everybody else, in which case your contribution isn't so important, or are you really very different? And so the idea here is that everybody has some extrinsic external centrality, which is this vector D, and the centrality vector should satisfy the relation C alpha of D is equal to alpha times C alpha D of A plus D. That's this line here. Okay. And if you solve this equation, you get that the C alpha of D is equal to this, okay? Um, and this you might notice is the Neumann expansion of the inverse of I minus alpha A inverse, okay? If you've ever studied um, Leontief growth, Leontief models, you have come across the Neumann expansion, um, uh, which is the sum one plus, you know, A plus A squared, I plus A plus A squared for matrices. 
right? And for productive matrices in the Leontief system, this gives the inverse of I minus A, okay? Um, and um, uh, the Neumann, by the way, is not von Neumann. There's actually another Neumann in mathematics. This is Hermann Neumann and uh, different guy, different concept. Okay, um, and again, um, this is related to uh, um, uh, eigenvector centrality as alpha gets very large. Okay, um, so these are all different measures of centrality and I'm throwing a lot of this stuff at you and there's no way that you're actually kind of getting it all down. But the point is, is that you have these stories about centrality and there are algebraic ways of expressing them, um, which then you know, give us things to operate on meaningfully. So let's actually see how centrality might actually come up, alpha centrality in particular, in an economic context, all right? So I want to study a game and I want to compute the Nash equilibrium of a game, okay? Um, so at this point, I want to ask the question is, oops, I want to go backwards. Okay, is everybody excited by the idea that we are now no longer talking about sociology? or math or linear algebra, but we're actually talking about economics, right? Okay, this is a good thing. This is what we're here for. All right, so here's a game. And this game uh, um, is a game where people have to make a choice. Um, and there's a, by the way, this game is actually studied a lot, okay? Um, um, if I actually gave names to the variables, we would see that this game um, arises in crime, it arises in education, peer effects, study of peer effects, so on and so forth. Um, I have a, a paper in the JPE written with Stephen Durloff and a couple of other co-authors, Raji Jayaraman. Uh, did she lecture here or is she lecturing here? I'm not sure. Um, uh, uh, but uh, there's another co-author on this paper and um, we essentially uh, wrote about the econometrics of, of identification and looking at an incomplete information version of a game like this. Okay, so how does this game actually work? Okay, forget all this stuff forget all of this for a moment and just look at this right here, okay? HI times XI minus XI squared divided by two, all right? I'm gonna call this the private component of your utility. And you're gonna choose, if you, were, if, you didn't have, if you didn't care about anything else and you only cared about, you know, if you were alone on a desert island, you would maximize the private component of your utility and you would be maximizing HI XI minus XI squared over two. And I'm sure that most of you have already done the first order calculation and realized that the solution to this is that you choose XI equal to HI, okay? So HI is what you would choose if you were left on your own, okay? But there's also a social component, okay? We are going to assume that people are interested in the average of what their neighbors are doing. So we're going to have a social matrix, a weighted social matrix, whose row sums are one. It's a stochastic matrix, or it looks like a Markov matrix. Row sums are one, okay? So what is this? Aij times xj summed over j. This is the average, okay, of the x's of people, the average of the behaviors of people that i is connected to, okay? Everybody understand? Now, what's going on in the utility function? This is a measure of distance. How far are you from the average of what everybody else is doing? And you get disutility, okay? This is a minus sign. So you get disutility by being far away from the average. If beta, beta, what does beta do? This is the public component of utility here. And beta essentially is a parameter that controls the marginal rate of substitution between the private and the public component of utility. Okay. If beta is really law, beta is really small, then person I is really an independent thinker. Okay. If beta is really large, this person is a camp follower. Okay. All right. Doesn't think for him or herself. Okay, it's the time for political jokes if we were in the United States. Um, so um, uh, uh, this is the game. So now you can see that what is the effect of this going to be? Everybody has their own HIs, okay? Um, uh, if everybody were maximizing on their own, they would just choose HI and that would be it. But now what's gonna happen is that you're gonna be pulled, everybody's gonna be pulled in the direction of their HI, but they're also gonna be pulled in the direction of where everybody else's 
right? Because of this average term, okay? So where is this gonna settle out? Just where it's gonna settle out is gonna be in Nash equilibrium, right? And we can compute the Nash equilibrium, okay? So let's let phi be this parameter beta divided by one plus beta. And it turns out that the equilibrium is one minus phi times I minus phi A inverse times H. Okay, this is just compute the, compute the first order conditions and crunch away. Okay, that's all there is to this. All right. Um, and um, uh, when beta is very large, um, um, uh, you can see uh, that, um, now what do I want to say? I don't, well, when, 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 when beta is very small, this is um, 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 uh, essentially uh, going to be uh, uh, one times H. In other words, everybody's going to be very near H. What you can see if you explore this a little bit more, and you know, do a little bit of calculation on a, on a yellow on the yellow pad that you all have at your side, you would see that as is as phi gets to one, right? What's happening is that everybody is converging to pretty much the same. Everybody is converging to the same thing. Okay. Um, now, what we can ask is, what about average play in the population? What is the average play in the population? So I know what every individual is doing, but what's the average going to be? And if I were now doing this as a game of incomplete information where we had some unobservable error terms in here, this would be an object that we would be, this would be a statistic that we would be studying in an empirical context. And again, if you're interested in seeing how that might work out, you might look at my 2015 uh, JPE paper with, uh, with Stephen um, and uh, Raji Jaraman and, and another guy, William Brock, Buzz Brock, as he's known. Um, so, what we want to do is now we want to compute this average X bar for what, what is the population average action. And if we do this calculation, what we see is that, is that uh, X bar is equal to one over N times the modified cat centrality vector times the vector H, the thing that people are bringing to the table. Okay, so the individual I's inference on the average choice of the population is proportional, okay, to um, his cat centrality, modified cat centrality with parameter beta over one plus beta, okay? So modified cat centrality is here the answer and the surprising answer, I might add, to an interesting economic question, how much influence does someone have on the equilibrium, right? By virtue of what is the private component of their preferences? I should do that. Right? What is the private component of their preferences? How much inference, in, influence do they have? Okay, so cat centrality is the answer to that. All right, everybody uh, happy with that? Okay, so this is a first economic application. We're gonna come back and talk about um, solving some more games with this um, at the end of our time. But um, for the moment, um, uh, let's go on and talk about labor markets. Okay, are there any more questions? Any questions at all? before we go on. And feel free to put stuff in the chat, okay? I think if you have a sore throat, you're not supposed to be drinking carbonated beverages, but I find the extra pain of the carbonation to be useful. So with that in mind, um, um, this is how do people find jobs? Okay, so here is a table that comes from a paper that we're gonna be talking about. And this table sums up studies on how people find jobs. Um, uh, a study from 1951, a study from 1970, um, a study from 74, a study from 1980. Um, this paper was published sometime in the 1990s. Um, but I see I managed not to put, um, um, in my notes, I managed not to put the date, but the date is actually in the references. Jim Montgomery is a very interesting guy. He got a, um, a PhD at Northwestern in economics, and then he got a took a first job at MIT in economics, 
and then went to LSE for a couple of years or UCL, I don't remember which, and then came back and took a job at the University of Wisconsin's Department of Sociology, which is an interesting way of lowering one's salary. But this is a top job because you know the University of Wisconsin, um, um, at least in those days, and it may still be for all I know, but in those days, the University of Wisconsin was to sociology as MIT was and is to economics, okay? So this was not a fall, this was a move in intellectual interest. And Jim is there to this day. And I believe he might have a co-appointment in economics, but if you look at his CV, you'll see that it's very sociologically oriented. So um, this is actually, this paper that we're talking about here is Jim's job market paper. Um, and you'll see right away that it has a lot of sociological content. So what do we learn from this? Okay, um, how do people find jobs? You might ask uh, friends and relatives, right? Uh, friends of friends, whatever. You might actually just knock on the door and say, do you have any work? You might go through an employment agency. You might answer an ad. You know, there are other ways. Today, we would have things like looking at, looking at, at, at job market websites and stuff like that, which were not, none of which were present at the time of even the latest study um, by Mary Corcoran. Um, and uh, uh, this is, um, uh, and in all of these things, we notice that, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, that the most common way to get a job is through um, social networks and through friends and relatives. The only of all of the jobs that are listed here, the only job for which this column is not the largest element is that for being an accountant in the recent Schultz study. Okay. Um, and even there, it's very, very close to the top numbers. I might add, by the way, economists, economists, sociologists, whose work we're going to be talking about, um, other economists. Okay. Um, so this is a topic of interest to both sociologists and economists, and we see that social networks are important for job search. Um, Mark Granovetter, still a sociologist at Stanford, um, and uh, the data that was reported on the previous slide came from his PhD thesis, and this too came from the book that came out of his PhD thesis, and he introduced um, a phrase um, and an idea to go along with that phrase. And the phrase is called weak ties. And he wrote a paper called The Strength of Weak Ties. And he had the following really intuitive idea. He said, suppose that you're looking for a job. You might ask your close friends, but you know, your close friends talk to the same people that you do. They're not likely to know job. They're not likely to know about jobs that you already haven't heard of in some other way. So basically these contacts are not particularly productive. On the other hand, if you call up that person that you met at a conference a year ago, or you know, have coffee with, you know, with a bunch of other people you know, once every couple of months or something, they have a different circle of friends and they have information that you're maybe less likely to have. And so those ties are likely to be more productive for getting a job, okay? So what, Granovetter wanted to do in his thesis was to look at this friends relative category and unpack friends and see whether, you know, what kinds of friends, what was the nature of attachment, okay, um, uh, to the from an individual to the individual who helped him find a job, okay. And so he had this idea, the strength of weak ties, weak ties, casual acquaintances, are more productive for search than our strong ties, people that are close to you. All right, that's his idea. All right, and 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 what this quotation is all about is how might you how might you measure ties? And he measures ties by how long in his thesis he measured them by, you know, how often do you actually talk to somebody? Uh, and what he found in his thesis, of course, um, and I think I actually have this on the next slide. Let's see. No, I don't. What he found in his thesis. Um, is that um, uh, what he did was he went out, there's a, he went to a kind of an upscale suburb of Boston called Newton, Massachusetts. And he looked at a sample of people who were professionals or manage, managers, managerial types who were changing jobs. 
And then he asked those who found the new, you know, who found new jobs through a contact of some kind. Um, how often did you see that contact? How often did you meet that con contact? Um, and this is what he used as his proxy for, for, for um, strength of tie. Um, and what he discovered was that people who he saw, who, who um, that um, only 16, only 17% of the respondents said that the person from whom they, through whom they found their job was somebody that they met often. Over half of them, uh, the people who found a job through contacts, found the job through a contact, through a person that they met only occasionally. In other words, a weak tie, okay? Uh, and then uh, people who you saw very rarely, uh, you saw, you know, they were productive uh, more, you know, more than people you saw often, but not as, as productive as people you saw occasionally. Um, so this is, this is, you know, kind of support for the strength of weak tie finding utility of weak ties for finding jobs. Now, um, um, what um, uh, uh, it, it turns out that this is awesome. One sees this often, okay? Um, excuse me, my computer is somehow falling off. I don't know what it's doing, but it's doing something. Um, okay, um, there. Okay, so, um, uh, Granovetter, um, uh, this idea of Granovetter has legs. A lot of people have repeated this study in a variety of different settings. Um, there was a, a, a guy named Valery Yakubovich in 2005 who did this uh, in a major Russian metropolitan area, found the same kind of thing. Um, it's been found in different cities in the United States and in Europe. It's been an often repeated study. People have tried to refine the idea of how one might measure ties and unpack it a bit more. This is a very productive idea. So we want to understand why that might be true. Um, so um, here is, a, I, I don't know if I want to do all of this. Um, there is an argument, okay, that says the following. Um, and, and this, uh, the, the next sequence of slides, which I'm actually gonna skip, um, makes the following argument, um, that if you have um, groups of people that are strongly connected and connected, um, uh, strongly connected to, you know, within each other, these are cliques, right? You have two cliques. And if you look at the ties that connect cliques, they are likely to be, um, they are likely to be weak ties, okay? Why is that? Um, and here's the basic argument. I'm just gonna kind of say this with my, with my, um, uh, with my mouse, okay, with my little hand. Um, suppose it is the case that whenever we have a triad of strong ties, okay, that that triad is gonna be closed off either by a strong or a weak tie, okay? Weak, weak triads are, you know, may or may not be closed off. Strong, weak triads may or may not be closed off, okay? Maybe more likely to be closed off, but strong, strong triads are always gonna be closed off, okay? Um, uh, in some way, either by a strong or a weak tie. And, um, what um, I want to argue is that if we see a situation like this where we have these kinds of cliques, okay, these are likely to be strong ties in here. These are strong ties. If we see this kind of structure, that means that these red bridges, right, these red bridges between these two cliques have to be weak ties. Why is that? If this AB bridge were a strong tie, then we have strong tie strong tie. So this is now connected. This guy and that guy are now connected. But if this guy and this guy are now connected and it's a weak tie, we're done. But if it turns out to be a strong tie, okay, then these guys are connected. Okay. So you can see that once, if this were a strong tie, this structure is going to fill in and the same thing down here. Okay. This guy, by virtue of, if this is strong, 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 that's a connection that we're going to have. This is a connection. Um, well, we're going to have this connection to begin with. 
then we're going to have from that, uh, uh, let's see, what else will we get from this? Um, uh, we'll get from this thing here, we'll get this connection. These things begin to get closer together. There's another way of talking about the strong weak tie idea, which is in terms of these cliques. Um, there's a fellow named Ron Burt, who is a sociologist who is either at the um, University of Chicago or at Harvard University and is a rival of uh, Mark Granovetter. It is very interesting to see them together at the same conference. They insult each other with one-liners at a very high rate um, throughout any kind of dialogue between them. It's really remarkable. Uh, I think I actually took notes the one time I was there on good insults that I could use at department meetings because these were these guys really don't like each other. Um, so Ron Burt's idea is the idea of a structural whole. He would say, you got a lot of stuff going on over here. You've got a lot of stuff going on over here. These guys, you know, right? He said, this area, this is a structural whole. There's not a lot of connection. His point in saying um, is, is a bit different than Granovetter's. And Ron Burke, by the way, studies organizations. And what Ron would say is that these guys bridge structural holes. And because they bridge structural holes, they are conduits. These guys are going to be high in terms of, of you know, measures of centrality that focus on information flow, okay? Uh, like closeness centrality and things like that. And consequently, for Ron, he says, these guys are powerful. So Ron, for instance, has a paper where he's gone into French firms and he's looked at executive compensation. And he's also looked at um, uh, the topology of the managerial network in the organization. And what he's done is taken measures of the degree to which people bridge these structural holes, okay, appropriate measures of centrality, and he has related them, found positive correlations between them and executive compensation. In other words, to say that the power that these people get actually gets turned into money. Okay, gets turned into compensation. Okay, so that's another path along which one could go uh, and study. I think that's a really interesting thing to do. And sociologists have looked at this, but economists have not. And, you know, we look at things a different way. I would like to think a more careful way than sociologists do. So there's stuff to do here. Okay, so I'm going to skip all of this. Um, and now what I want to do is I want to go back to Jim Montgomery's job market paper. Come on, what's going on here? Um, Okay. Um, all right. So what Jim did was to build a model of a labor market, a very, very neoclassical model of a labor market, in order to talk about um, what um, uh, uh, what um, uh, social structure can do, how social structure can impact economic outcomes. Okay. So here is the model that 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 he wrote, and this is a little bit wrong up here. Um, it's not that workers live, well, th there are workers. The model goes for two periods, okay? There are first period workers and second period workers, okay? The number of workers is the same in both periods. In each period, half of the workers are high ability workers and produce one unit of output. Half of the workers are low ability workers and they produce zero units of output. Okay. Unfortunately for firms, workers are observationally indistinguishable. Okay. So you can't tell ex ante when you go to hire someone and they're sitting across from you and giving you, you know, you're in the job interview, you can't tell whether they are, it's just like hiring assistant professors. You can't tell whether they're high ability or low ability. Okay. You will in your lives likely be on both sides of that transaction and you'll see. Okay. So this is real. All right. Um, now, um, there's, we're, we're going to, um, we have, we're going to have a bunch of firms and every firm is going to employ one worker. Okay. The profit that the firm makes is going to be the employee productivity minus the wage rate. And the wage rate is one of the things that we're going to have to determine. Okay. Um, uh, if you have a productive worker, your profits are going to be one minus W, taking W for the wage rate. If you have an, a low ability worker, your profits are going to be minus W, you're going to have lost money. 
we're going to assume that uh, entrepreneurs are risk neutral. So they care about expected profits. Furthermore, we're going to expect, we're going to assume that there is free entry of firms into this market. And the effect of that is that we will only have, we will have only N operating firms, every firm hiring one worker, but um, the wage rate will be equal to the, you know, to the expected value of the worker. Okay, expected profits of every firm will be zero, right? If expected profits were positive, more firms would enter. So the equilibrium condition here um, is that each firm is maximizing expected profits and expected profits are zero in equilibrium. We have a behavioral rule. This is the way that all equilibrium models work, right? There's a behavioral rule each firm maximizes expected profits. And then there's an equilibrium condition and that equilibrium condition is expected profits are zero. Okay, everybody understand? So this is the, like the simplest possible, this is like too easy to be on microeconomic qualifying exams. Okay, um, so um, but before, we, before we talk about social structure, we might ask, if, suppose that there's, that, that, that what I've described is, you know, is, is the basic economic model. What is the, what does the wage rate have to be? Okay, if half of the workers are high ability and half of the workers are low ability, right? Then expected output, right? It's gotta be one half, right? And therefore the wage rate has to be one half if expected um, profits are going to be zero. So we've already solved the model if this were an economics class, right? If this were graduate microeconomic theory, we go and have lunch. Or you'd go and have lunch, I'd go to bed, all right? Um, but it's not an economics class. Well, it is an economics class, but we're advanced. We're doing harder stuff. So we're gonna have social structure, okay? So what does the social structure look like? We're going to have um, uh, 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 the workers who work at time one are retired, but still alive at time two. And they know, um, uh, maybe they know, or maybe they don't know, but they know a time one worker, okay? And for reasons of making the model tractable, Jim assumed that um, uh, every time one worker knows at most one time two worker, okay? Now, um, what is the probability that a time one worker knows a time two worker? That probability is tau, okay? Second bullet point, that probability, where are we? We are here, that probability is tau. So tau is the probability that a given time one worker knows a time two worker. And these assignments are all random, okay? So, so um, um, we flip a coin to decide whether a time one worker is going to know a time two worker or not. If he does, we're gonna choose a time two worker at random for time one worker to know, okay? So it, it, every time one worker knows at most one time two worker, it could be the case, however, that some time two workers know um, more than one um, time one worker, all right? Because, you know, the, you get the random draw of the time two guys, well, you could have, one worker could have been chosen twice. Um, I have a feeling this model is simpler if you get rid of that and you assume that there's a matching, but um, I haven't uh, actually worked that out yet. I should do that sometime. Um, now, um, big deal, there are social ties. Why would this matter for the economy? It would matter for the economy if these ties were somehow informative, all right? So think about this. Um, suppose that you're a firm and you have a worker, a time one worker, who's productive, all right? Now, you know something about that worker. You've learned that that worker is productive. Suppose you also know that that worker has a friend, right? If in fact, workers tended to hang with workers like themselves, that suggests that this friend might be productive as well. And so that would be a good guy to hire, all right? So this is gonna be a market where there's gonna be referrals, okay? So let's see how this works out. So conditional on having a tie, that tie is going to be to the same type of worker with probability alpha greater than one half. Tau measures, how likely it is that there is a social tie. Alpha measures how, in, how um, informative that social tie is. Okay, everybody understand? 
So um, Montgomery refers to tau as the network density because the higher is tau, the more, more nodes there are going to be. And he refers to alpha, he uses the unfortunate phrase inbreeding bias. Another phrase to use would be homophily, right? There is a word that a sociologists talk about, homophily. And this is the tendency of people in social networks to connect to people who are like them. Okay. And I had a section on homophily back that I skipped over, you might remember. So there are some slides in this slide pack that you might take a look at if you want to know more about that. So this is really, this alpha is really a measure of homophily, or it's a measure of informativeness of social ties. Um, you can imagine how the market's going to work. Um, in the first period, we're going to have an anonymous, no, nobody knows anything in the first period. So we're just going to have your usual anonymous labor market where firms just hire workers, the market clearing wage is gonna be WM1, okay? Um, we've already discussed the case where tau is equal to zero or alpha is equal to one half. This is, the, these, this is the case where there are no social ties or where social ties are uninformative, okay? And in that case, either case, we know that the market clearing wage is gonna be one half, okay? So then production is gonna occur. We hire the workers, production takes place, each firm learns its workers' productivities, okay? Now, it's time for the period two labor market. What a firm can do is, and it will do this, is if it has a productive worker, it can make an offer to that worker's, to, to, to that worker's friend, okay? And, and there will be a referral wage uh, which is going to be W of RF. There's enough symmetry in this model. This is a perfectly competitive model after all, that that referral wage is going to be the same for anybody who makes a referral. But think about it this way. Would you um, make a referral offer if, um, um, if your worker were unproductive? We will see in equilibrium that you won't do that. Okay. Um, so, what happens is that referral offers are made. Um, then there is a decision about whether to accept referral offers or not. We will see that in equilibrium, all referral offers are accepted, okay? But now we've got leftover workers and those leftover workers are of two kinds. They are friends of, of, of unproductive workers who themselves may or may not be productive, but are more likely to be unproductive. There are also people who had no first period friends who are equally likely to be productive or unproductive. We have an anonymous labor market for them. Okay, production occurs and then the market ends. That's the end of the story. Everybody got it? Make sense? Okay. All right, you can go dig up Montgomery's paper. Um, uh, it's really easy, an easy read. Um, okay, what does equilibrium look like? Well, only firms with good workers are gonna make referral offers because think about it this way. Um, the anonymous market is gonna contain any, you know, if, if, if firms with, uh, if, if only firms with one worker, workers will make referral offers, then it is the case that the anonymous market is going to contain a mix of, of people who were friends of zero workers and people who were not matched at all. And so they are going to be an anonymous random draw from that, <coughs> from those leftover people is going to be better than a random draw from a than a referral from a type zero worker, right? Because the, you know, the anonymous market is a mixture of type zero worker friends, plus these guys who are, you know, could be anything, but just weren't matched. So that's going to be a better group than friends of type workers, a type zero workers alone. Okay. So why would you make a referral offer to somebody who is more likely to be bad than a draw you could get from the anonymous market? Okay. Um, and so that behavior is self-sustaining in equilibrium. And if you think about it a little bit more, you can see that other, other behaviors are not. Um, referral wage offers are distributed on an interval, uh, on some interval, uh, where the bottom interval is the, uh, the bottom of the interval is the anonymous market wage and the top of the interval is some number. Um, why is this the case? 
So there's a little bit, you, you don't really see it right away, but there's a little bit of monopoly power um, in this market. Um, type two, how do I, no, where am I, where am I, back. Um, period two workers who are friends of two different type one workers that are both productive are going to get two referral offers. Or if they're friends of three, they're going to get three referral offers. So they're going to have some market power. Okay. The consequence of that market power for equilibrium, and this is something that was well studied back in the 1980s. There's a large literature on this. The uh, and and Montgomery cites it, so you could you could take a look at it. It's it's useful facts to know in many many other contexts. Um, but the outcome of that is that the competitive equilibrium wages are going to be um, distributed on an interval. It's, 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 there's a, a distribution of wages. The law of one price breaks down. Okay. Um, uh, but we do know these facts. We know something about the interval in which they come from. We also know that the referral, uh, the, the anonymous market wage in the second period has to be less than one half. Okay. Why? Because it's a mix of people who are random draws, the unsocialized, who are 50-50, good or bad, and uh, the people who are friends of type zero workers, unproductive workers, who are themselves more likely to be unproductive than productive. So a random draw from that group is going to have expected, pro expected productivity less than one half. Okay. Um, you do the calculations, you see the profits in the second period are greater than zero. And here's a really big and interesting final result. And that is that if you look at the wage rates in the first period, they are going to be greater than one half. Why is that? This is economics at its finest, okay? The value of a hire in the first period is that worker's expected productivity plus the expected value of a friend that that person might have, the expected value with the social tie. Because with some probability, this worker is gonna be product, unproductive and I'm gonna get zero and I don't care about his friend. That's probability one half. And with probability one half, okay, um, this guy is productive and with some additional probability, you know, and, and then with some lower probability, he's gonna have a friend and that friend is more likely or not than not to be productive, productive and that's someone that I'm gonna wanna hire, okay? So the value of a worker now is not just the value of their, output, but it's also the value of the referral network that they bring with them. Okay. Isn't that nice? Isn't that remarkable? Okay. You don't look excited. You should be excited. This is exciting. Really. Even, you know, for me, it's 11, 11, 15 at night, and I am still excited about this. And I can't tell you how many times I've lectured on this paper and I still get excited. What about comparative statics? There are two ways in which the referral networks become more valuable, either because they become some combination, not any one or both of these things. They can become denser, which is to say there are more referrals to be had, or each referral could be more informative. Alpha goes up, okay? What are the effects of this? In either case, the anonymous market looks worse Okay, and so M2 goes down uh, for reasons that we're not going to get into. The upper bound on the referral wage offer is going to go up. Profits are going to go up. And because referrals are more valuable, first period wages are going to go up. Okay. So, um, so what we're really doing is, you know, we're, 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 we're gaining, um, I don't want to say that we're gaining economic efficiency. You know, we're really not gaining economic efficiency here because total output is the same in both markets, right? We have, we're going to, we, we have, you know, a large number of firms that are trying to compete. Okay. All workers are going to be hired. There's N workers in each, in each market, right? So the expected output in both in, in no matter what the market situation is, the expected output is N over two right? Half of the workers are in each period. So for a total of N over the two periods. And that's true regardless of social structure. But what this sorting does, you know, what this informative structure does 
um, is that um, it, is, it, 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 it generates economic rents, some of which goes to the firms, some of which goes to first period workers. Those rents are extracted from second period workers who are not socially well connected. Um, the distribution, I didn't say this on the slide, but what's happening, of course, is that the distribution of wage income is getting worse in the second period, okay? Because the gap between referral wage, um, uh, um, expected referral wage and the market wage is going down, okay? So this is, you know, this is, uh, um, we're getting inequality because of social networks, okay? Um, and in this case, we're getting it without any efficiency gain. So this is a fascinating model, okay? And I think, um, ah, so um, what is actually the value of social networks, okay? What happens when you actually look at empirical work on this? I thought we should conclude this section with a discussion of this. Um, uh, and uh, this comes from a paper uh, uh, NBER working paper by Adriana Laris Mooney, Matt Miller, Xuyang Sheng, and Veronica Silvero. It's a NBER working paper published last year, a year ago, June. Okay. Um, and um, uh, what the authors are interested in, the, the, the title is Party On The Labor Market Returns to Social Networks and Socializing. And um, um, what they do um, is the following. There is a data set, um, uh, the National Longitudinal Survey of Adolescent Health. Um, uh, it's a data set in the United States that has social network data. And so, um, and it also, you know, it's a panel data set and it has earnings information on people, you know, 10 years out of high school. And so, um, uh, what they did in this paper um, was to look for men and for women, um, uh, uh, to look at the um, effects. This is a standard thing that every, on, on the, you can't see this because of the wrong mouse. This is a standard thing that everybody does. If you look at the effects of years of schooling, right? Here's, here's American high school graduation. Um, uh, here is college graduation. Um, here is someone who's a little bit more than halfway through an economics PhD program, okay? Um, uh, and um, uh, so um, you can look at, at, at years of education and you can look at the effects of this on earnings. And I don't know how many years out this was, but if they're looking at people with 20 years of schooling and this data was collected first in the first wave in high schools, um, then it must be more than 10 years, right? Um, so, uh, well, it could be, I don't know, let's just leave it, leave it at that. I think it's 10 years since graduation from it, 10 years since labor market entrance. And so what we're seeing here, of course, is the usual thing that says that, that log earnings increases, right, with years of education. What's really interesting, though, is to compare this with the graphs on the, on, on the right. On the right, what they're looking at is the size of individual social networks in high school. Okay, um, so the ad, ad health data set actually asked people to name five of their friends. And this data, you know, they went to a high school and they surveyed everybody in the high school. Okay, and they did this for a lot of different high schools around the United States. And so they had data on friendship networks. And this is probably the most used data set for social network research um, um, by labor economists of all stripes. Okay, so, um, and here what we see is that uh, log of earnings at the same time period, you know, um, out, right, however long that is, is increasing in the size of your social network. So people who had, were more social, okay, had higher social networks, right, end up having, having more, you know, having higher earnings. Now, we can think of a lot of reasons about why this might be true, okay. It might be that these social networks actually persist and are productive of, um, of, uh, uh, of jobs. Now, I'm not so sure that that's terribly important because these are high school social networks. This data, I think the social network data came from the 90s um, and the web was not a gigantic, well, you know, I, that's, I'm gonna take that back. 
even though the web was not gigantic then, I think, you know, by uh, uh, 10 years later, people were already making, you know, we're, we're connecting again on Facebook, which was one of the first social networks out there. And there were, there were other things like MySpace, which has since disappeared. And so I think that it might be that some of these social networks persisted, not to the degree that they would today, um, but they did persist uh, to some degree. But it's also true, of course, that people who have large social networks also have a set of social skills that might be very productive for finding good jobs <clears throat> and earning a lot of money. And they didn't sort that out in this picture. But the point of this picture is, so maybe there is a latent variable that we don't see here. And this is a good reason why you wanna come back to economic theory. Is the causal effect that we're seeing the measured effect or is there a latent variable that we're not seeing? And this is what economic theory is actually about, helping us figure these things out, distinguishing these. All right, so not to beat that horse anymore, um, I wanna say that um, what you, the comparison to make here is that the increase in wage earnings associated with one more friend is about two, two and a half percent. By comparison, one more year of education um, leads to about a 10% increase in earnings. Okay, so what you can see is that is that um, uh, one friend is worth a quarter of a year of education. You have four friends, you could drop a year of school. Okay, so that's, that's the, that's the trade-off that this picture suggests. And this is the trade-off that they state in the paper. But this is an NBER working paper. You can find it online. You should, you should take a look at this. Um, I am nearly out of time. I wanna talk about diffusion of behavior on a social network. And I'm gonna do this very quickly, okay? Um, uh, so here is a game, okay? A is a positive number, okay? Um, you can either choose uh, the go it alone strategy, which I've labeled D, think of defection. You can defect from social norms and go alone <coughs> and get one. Or you can play a cooperative strategy and the cooperative strategy pays off one plus A if your partner cooperates, uh, but zero uh, if your partner does not. This is a stag hunt, right? How many of you have heard the phrase? Okay, you might have. Um, it's a standard game. And this game has a, um, uh, uh, let, let's take A to be equal to three halves. It has two equilibria. Uh, actually, it has three equilibria. It has an equilibrium where, where both players defect. It has an equilibrium where both players cooperate. By equilibrium, I mean Nash equilibrium. And there's a mixed equilibrium where the probability of cooperating is two fifths, okay? Now, I want to imagine the following story. Um, people are connected on a network. Okay, so here's a guy and he's connected to these uh, seven people um, on this network, okay? And he is gonna choose a strategy and everybody else is going to choose a strategy, okay? And, um, uh, and then the payoff that say our red individual is going to get is going to be the sum of the payoffs from all of the games with the two person games with everybody he's connected to. So he's gonna, if he chooses C, he's gonna get the CC payoff here, here. Oh, you can't see that. Here, here, he's gonna get this CC payoff, this CC payoff, and then here and here and here, he's gonna get the DD payoffs. So he's gonna get four CC payoffs and three DD payoffs, right? Everybody understand? Okay, so everybody gets, you, everybody chooses a strategy, then you get a payoff from every person you're connected to, and that payoff depends upon your choice, upon their choice, okay, and uh, is given by the payoff table. And the choice that you make applies to everybody to whom you're connected. Everybody agree? Okay, so um, uh, here's the question I wanna ask, okay? What does it take? for this cooperative strategy, this cooperative behavior to diffuse through a social network, okay? So here we have a little social network with uh, six people, okay? Um, uh, and what th the process I'm going to imagine is the following, that um, 
uh, that uh, everybody is going to start off by using D. And then we're going to have like one person try out this new strategy C. And now the question is, um, you know, will, will that catch on? Okay. So we're going to let we're going to we, we're going to start with this initial seed to say this red dot down below is choosing C and at random moments we're going to let we're going to choose it, an individual at random so we're going to have random time random uh, person. Um, and that person is going to have actually we don't even need random moments at period one we're going to choose a person at random and give that person an opportunity to flip and then at period two we're going to choose another person opportunity and give that person an opportunity to flip. And what they are um, going to respond to is instantaneous payoff. Um, so they're not forward looking. Um, they're just going to look and say like what this guy might say here is, well, he's a C playing against two Ds. Um, he's getting zero from these. So even though he started with the experiment, if he gets a chance to undo it, he would go backwards. Okay. And go back to black and he would disappear and, and, and the, the, the new strategy would disappear. So let's actually trace this out. So suppose, oops, wrong way. Suppose that the first person we draw at random is the dot that has now just turned from black to blue, okay? Now, what is this person gonna do, okay? Um, that's a good question. And I need to look at my notes to find out what this person is gonna do. Um, okay, so this person is connected up, um, um, with uh, there, he has he has one neighbor playing um, the the threshold. This in order for C to be a better response than D, you need to have two fifths of your neighbors. Professor, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, because a student will have another uh, sessions at at eleven thirty, so maybe we need to. Oh, then uh, why don't I just stop? Uh, eleven thirty uh, in Hong Kong time, so we need to uh, maybe round up the lessons. Oh, all right. So I guess I will see some of you tomorrow. Uh, and if you have any questions, just um, um, drop me a uh, a line, and we can arrange to talk um, at some point if you'd like. Okay. All right. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm.